I can't do it. Okay. We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! Time to rise and grind. Are you kidding me? Holy on smoke! And let's get this banter going. It's bacon! This is Snowman in the Morning. Does anybody else feel like a fried egg? And it begins now. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell. I think I just broke my chair. He did what? Has anybody ever told you you have a serious impulse control problem? There is but one cause for me to follow. Almighty oh, the bum! And here we go. Oh, yeah! You. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of uh, Snowman of the Morning. Wasn't on yesterday because the thing that you hear, I didn't have much of after what happened Sunday, and I'll get to that in just a moment. If you want to be a sponsor of this year's program, drop an email to snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. That's snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. Kind of change the address up a little bit. As for the show, follow us on all of our social media, including Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And I read that all out of order. ID you need is SITM9 to noon. That's SITM, the number 9, T-O-N-O-O-N. On this Tuesday edition, going to wrap up the conference championships, going to show much love to the 49ers, and I'm going to twist the knife and all the people that hated on the 49ers all season long and i'm going to do it very playfully y'all know i love to have fun here a little bit of nba chant cold uh, nba chat rather cole johnson will join me chris purtle scheduled to join me desmond johnson will join me cj swartz on for hour three to talk some baseball but let me get started in saying i told y'all so when i said on this program with my buddy Mike DeBate, who I'll have on Wednesday, that the San Francisco 49ers would be the NFC West champions, the top seed, and they would represent the NFC in the Super Bowl, people thought I was absolutely bleeping crazy. Well, I told you. I told you so. They've been beat up. They've been nicked up. They haven't had a bye since week four. But when they clinched the NFC West title, they were well overdue for a bye. They got the bye. They healed. They got healthy. Minnesota came in, got smashed. Green Bay came in, got smashed. And now it's on to Miami for my beloved San Francisco 49ers. They win 37 to 20 on Sunday. And this is where I share a funny story about my beloved wife, my beloved Dr. K. When we were checking out the game and working on some projects on Sunday, when Raheem Mostert scored his first touchdown, I got excited, got up, ran out the room, scared the dog. Dog got mad at me, jumped in my lap for basically the rest of the first half, looking at me, Daddy, you can't scare me like that. But before she jumped in my lap, she went over to my went over to my wife and she said, did daddy scare you? But uh, when she looked, my wife looked over and saw that it was 27 to nothing. She looked at me and said, I'm going to bed. This game's over. And it was over. And to think the Packers started the game with a three and out defensively. They started with a three and out. They kept the 49ers from getting the first down. Then they surrendered the ball back, and the 49ers took it right down the field and marched into the end zone, led 7-0. Game was over there. You can throw all the stats you want about Aaron Rodgers at me. You can throw all the stats about Aaron Jones you want at me. You can throw the fact that Brian Balaga was back in the contest after getting injured in Week 12 when these two teams met. But the facts still remain the same. The 49ers are healthy, and the 49ers defensively, are ferocious 
The one thing they want to do, they want to pound you into dust. They are physical up front, offensively and defensively. George Kittle had only one catch on Sunday afternoon. It went for 19 yards. But the number I want to point out is 285. Know what that number represents? The number of rushing yards that the 49ers had on Sunday. Second straight playoff game where as a team they've rushed for two uh, plus 200 yards. Raheem Mostert, 29 carries, 220 yards, not one, not two, not three, but four touchdowns. Four. Three came in the first half. And people meant to tell me or kept trying to tell me that the Packers would have something for them? Are you kidding me? Not after what I saw. I'm not selling Aaron Rodgers' talent short at all. I'm not. But the one thing you have to do is take Aaron Rodgers out of his comfort zone. That's the thing about the West Coast offense. I've said it for years. I've said it on this show for years. How do you stop a West Coast offense? You make the person in the pocket uncomfortable. And that's what the 49ers did in November before Thanksgiving and on Sunday night. They harassed the daylights out of Aaron Rodgers. Say all you want. Say what you want about the fact that Aaron Jones was a better running back than Dalvin Cook. My friend Trey Larkins is a big-time Packer fan, and he posted something on Facebook where he went on this little rant, and Trey, I love you like a brother, and I'm being very, I'm being very, very playful, very playful. He went on this little rant because, as I said, he is a big-time Packer fan. And I understand supporting your team. I get that. I totally understand that. He first posted, I told Diner fans back in November that we would see them again and that 37-8 win wouldn't happen. Well, it didn't happen, but... We hung 37 on him again, and this is the post that he that he put up. It's funny as I was. It's funny I was just sitting here thinking to myself. Everybody is saying the 49ers have a better team than my Packers, but we have the more proven tight end. Yeah, Kittle better than Graham right now, but Jimmy Garoppolo, but Jimmy Graham overall is more proven than George Kittle. Really, the best running back on the field in Aaron Jones, and probably the better combo of backs between Jones and Williams. I take them over Coleman, Breida, and Mostert. Really? And you're talking about a team that hung 283 rushing yards on you. I'd take Coleman, Mostert, and Breida over Jones and Williams any day of the week. The best wide receiver on the field in Devontae Adams, and it's not close. No, it's not close, but Devontae Adams was not a factor. I haven't even gotten to the quarterback who we all know has the advantage at that position. Ain't wrong. He didn't have the advantage because he got harassed all night long. Even the records are identical at 14 and 3, but somehow, someway, everybody's saying the Niners are significantly, significantly better than my Packers. We are. But just keep downing my Packers and keep that same energy tomorrow night after we pull off the upset on our way to Miami. Didn't happen. You only scored 20 points. And 13 of those came uh, 13 of those came late. You missed a two-point conversion. You're going to look at the numbers and see that Aaron Rodgers threw for over 300 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, he also was picked twice. This game was over at halftime when it was 27 to nothing. Let that sink in for a moment, folks. In the two meetings with the Green Bay Packers and the San Francisco 49ers, I want you to listen to me carefully, please. Please listen carefully. In the first half, between these two teams, Green Bay did not score a point. Yet they surrendered 50. They surrendered 50 points in two games in the first half between these two teams. Now, they scored 28 points overall against us, but they were outscored 74 to 28. 23 in the first half in November, 27 in the first half Sunday night. And I go back to the last line. Even the records are identical at 14 and 3, but somehow, someway, everybody's saying the Niners are significantly better than my Packers. They are, once again. 
But just keep downing my Packers and we'll and keep that same energy tomorrow night after we pull off the upset on our way to Miami. Well, I got news for you, Trey Larkins. I love you like a brother, but the team that everybody was downing was San Francisco. And they've been down in San Francisco all year because they were trying to put the onus on Jimmy Garoppolo. My friend Cole Johnson, who I will have on here later, said that the 49ers will go as far as Jimmy G could take them. Jimmy G will take them. I beg your pardon. And you know what everybody meant? That he needed to throw for 4,000 yards and 50 touchdowns and just guide this team through the air. No, he didn't. He guided this team on the ground. Aside of the Baltimore Ravens, the 49ers had the best running attack in the National Football League. Period. They had the number one rushing attack in the NFC. Period. Facts. They had three running backs that gained at least 600 yards. Facts. And as long as my math remains the way that it is, I'll take three over one any time. Now, granted, Breida hasn't seen the ball much, but I expect him to a couple of weeks in Miami. And you know something Kyle Shanahan has done and continued to do? Hand the ball off to the fellow that has the hot hand. And yesterday it was Raheem Mostert. 29 carries, 220 yards, four touchdowns. You know, the only running back who scored more rushing touchdowns in a playoff game, he was also a 49er. Ricky Waters, he scored five. Mostert had four. It was 34-7 to seven at the end of three periods. 34-7. to seven. Let me repeat myself. It was 34-7 to seven at the end of three periods. You hear that silence? That's coming from Wisconsin, and I'm being very playful here. You hear that silence? It's coming from Wisconsin. It's coming from all the cheeseheads that I know that are Packer fans, that believed in their team. Now, if the reverse would have happened, I would be eating a big old slice of crow with humble pie, and I would do it proudly. I'd do it very proudly, okay? But this is one of the few times I actually get to brag because my team is in the Super Bowl. And my team since 1981 has been the San Francisco 49ers. Why? The greatest quarterback to ever put on a uniform. And his name is Joe Montana. Now, I know that's going to make Mike DeBate very angry, Ian Glendon very angry and, we, a- angry, and we've had some playful discussions about that. So you all know how I feel. But after Nick Bosa was drafted, by the 49ers and I looked at that team and they signed Quan Alexander they picked up D Ford I knew that defense would be ferocious all the questions were on offense but then the running game started picking up steam I'll tell you the exact game I will tell you the exact game where the 49 where I knew the 49ers would have a whale of a season week three against the Pittsburgh Steelers Why am I picking that game? There's no way that the 49ers should have turned the ball over five times and won that game. There's no way that should have happened. And yet it did happen. They won that game 24-20. And oh, by the way, Jimmy Garoppolo threw the game-winning touchdown pass to Dante Pettis. Oh, by the way, Jimmy Garoppolo threw a game-winning touchdown to Jeff Wilson Jr. against the Arizona Cardinals. Oh, by the way, Jimmy Garoppolo has thrown for four touchdowns three separate times. Twice came against the Cardinals. Oh, by the way, Jimmy Garoppolo engineered a win in Seattle, which wasn't supposed to happen. Oh, by the way, Jimmy Garoppolo, who the yeah buts get on my nerves too, and I know I'm coming up on a break, but the yeah buts get on my nerves too yeah but who san francisco played everybody on their schedule yeah but how is jimmy g gonna fare 3978 yards 27 touchdowns 13 interceptions yeah but yeah but yeah but yeah but the 49ers are in the super bowl yeah but the 49ers crushed the packers again Yeah, but the minnesota vikings came in off of an emotional high and the 49ers pounded them into dust Again, if you want to go back to the 80s where the Vikings and 49ers were hooking up every year in the playoffs. 
so all the yeah buts can stop it. I'll do a snowman's take tomorrow because I'm like I said, I'm coming up on a break and I got Cole Johnson coming at the bottom of this hour. We're going to do this and we're going to do this Cole Johnson conversation in two parts because, you know, we got to you, you know, we're going to get on the phone. And we're going to have some fun. So, yeah, save all the yeah buts. And I bet you any kind of money, if the 49ers lose the Super Bowl in two weeks on February 2nd in Miami, the yeah buts will come creeping back in. But what if they win? Which I believe they will. I truly believe they will. Take a pause for a break. When we come back, I'll break down the AFC Championship. Congratulations to the Chiefs. You win the Lamar Hunt Trophy. You also get to face the best defense in the NFL. Back in a flash. This is Snowman in the Morning. I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. Welcome back to the Tuesday edition of uh, Snowman in the Morning. Glad to have you with us. Don't forget to follow all of our social media, including Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. The ID you need is... SITM 9 to noon. That's SITM, the number 9, T O N O O N. And if you want to be a sponsor of this here program, drop an email to our new email address, snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. That's snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. You can sponsor this show, the Daily BS, NBA podcast that I have on the way, or all of our play by play action that is housed under Arena Sports Net. Now, the 49ers need an opponent, and that opponent is the high-flying Kansas City Chiefs. Our congratulations to Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, and the rest of the Chiefs as they beat the Tennessee Titans 35-24, to and it took another magical second quarter by Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs to erase a 17-7 to deficit. The way the Titans slowed the game down, you think, uh-oh. Derrick Henry is going to have another one of those kind of games. And then Patrick Mahomes said, oh, yeah, I can move my feet, too. And he had a run in the second quarter to give the Chiefs the lead where he, as the late great Jim Durham would say, tightrope the sidelines, stayed in bounds, and spun into the end zone. Wow. That run gave the Chiefs a lead they wouldn't relinquish. And they went 35 to 24, and they reached their first Super Bowl since Hank Stram led them to the Super Bowl in 1969, where they defeated the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl IV. Fifty years, they finally claimed the Lamar Hunt Trophy, and after the disappointment they went through last year, losing at home at the hands of Tom Brady and the New England Patriots, the Chiefs got their revenge. They got some serious help from the Titans knocking out both the Patriots and the Baltimore Ravens because had the Ravens won, the Chiefs would have had to travel to Baltimore. But Patrick Mahomes is the truth, man. Patrick Mahomes is athletic. He's got a great arm. He can fit the ball into the tightest of spaces and throw at the weirdest of arm angles. But if I see a potential flaw with Patrick Mahomes, it's the same flaw that applies with one Aaron Rodgers. And that flaw is you have to make Mahomes uncomfortable. You have to harass him. And I think the best defense in the NFL to harass him, he will see them in Miami. As far as the Kansas City defense goes, I thought Frank Clark would be a liability. He's turned into a strength for them. That Chiefs defense got after Ryan Tannehill, and you can expect them to get after Jimmy Garoppolo the same way, the exact same way. I wouldn't be surprised if this was either a high-scoring game or one of those New York Giants, New England Patriot-type games where it ended up 17-14. I wouldn't be surprised either way, man. I would not be surprised either way. But the Chiefs finally got the job done after a bunch of near misses, including 
losing AFC championships, losing AFC divisional playoffs at home. Anybody remember the double overtime game against Miami in 1972? Last year, as I mentioned, against the New England Patriots, a couple of close losses they had against the Indianapolis Colts. And they finally got it done with Andy Reid. The knock on Andy Reid was that he couldn't win the big one. Well, he's got a second shot with his second team to win the big one. He's got a second shot with his second team to win the big one. Of course, the first team he took was the Philadelphia Eagles with Donovan McNabb and company. Now you have a more dynamic quarterback. You got one of the best receivers in the league in Tyreek Hill. Got one of the best tight ends in Travis Kelsey. And I say one of the best because the best resides in the Bay, and that's George Kittle. But it's going to be a chess match. Kyle Shanahan making his second Super Bowl appearance, first as a head coach. Andy Reid, his second Super Bowl appearance as a head coach. You have a pair of offensive minds that are going to lock horns in the Super Bowl. We've seen what the Chiefs can do offensively. We've seen what the 49ers can do offensively. I won't be able I won't start my breakdowns until next week. Uh, at least I won't until Wednesday when I get Mike on board. And believe me, I'm going to have Mike debate on board Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. Sunday's Super Bowl special will be moved to the afternoon. It'll carry the snowman in the morning name, but it'll be moved to uh, moved to the afternoon. I had to move some things around. No pun intended. But The Kansas City Chiefs took all of the pain, all of the frustration, all of the, for lack of a better term, hatred that happened last year when, again, the whispers became loud that Andy Reid could not win the big one. And he won the big one. He absolutely won the big one. Now he's got one bigger one to get. He's got a bigger one to get now, and this is Andy Reid's chance to prove all the doubters wrong. This is Andy Reid's chance to prove that he does belong in the upper coaching echelon, and he's belonged there for years. Don't get it twisted, but you know how a lot of people think. You know how a lot of people think. They want to see Super Bowl championships, plural, championships. That's what people want to see. That's what people want to see, championships. Is it going to be tough for the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah, you better believe it is. I won't go out on a limb and say they may need to draw on the spirit of one Henry Stram to get them through this game, but the Chiefs are going to have a challenge ahead of them the same way the 49ers are going to have a challenge with the Kansas City offense. It's going to be a hell of a Super Bowl. Who'd have thunk it? Who would have thunk it that we would see a Super Bowl for the first time in three years without Tom Brady? How about that? And the Kansas City Chiefs got the AFC Championship done at home, presented the Lamar Hunt Trophy in front of Chiefs Kingdom, which also reminds me, I need to pay a visit to Steve Willis. He's a big-time Chiefs fan. I need to get him on later in the week to talk all about the Kansas City Chiefs. It's going to be a great Super Bowl, folks. Two very worthy teams made it to the Super Bowl. Congratulations to the Chiefs and to the 49ers. Take a pause for a break, and when we come back, I have to split a phone call. I'm going to have Cole Johnson on to close out this first hour, and I'm also going to have him on during the third hour. How am I going to do that one? You'll find out in a flash. This is Snowman in the Morning, where true sports talk lives. Me, what's up, Doc? We continue on the Tuesday edition of uh, Snowman in the Morning. Glad that you are with us. Hey, don't forget to check out our social media 
Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Pinterest, and Twitter. The ID you need is SITM9 to noon. That's SITM, the number 9, T O N O O N. As we welcome you back into the show and welcome you back to my studio here in uh, North Carolina. And we are all over the place this morning, but I didn't get a chance to get on air yesterday. But wrapping up the AFC and NFC championship games, and I get to say I told you so for a while. And I'm going to have fun with that for the next couple of weeks. Now it's time for me to welcome one of my good friends. His name is Cole Johnson, that man in charge of Cole Sports. And he joins me right now. How are you, my brother? Oh, man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good this Tuesday morning. Uh, I cannot complain. Doesn't it feel good to be one of the folks that has a nationally syndicated show when no one thought we would – when no one thought you or I would have that, doesn't that feel good? <laughs> it feels it, it feels really good, and and it, it's it's validation to the work yeah, that is. both you and I put into the craft. And when you've had other people say you don't have the voice, you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the talent, you don't have the wherewithal, you don't have the stroke, and we both can equally individually and collectively say up yours to all of you with all that because we have all that now it's proven (laughs) we ended it before they knew what to do with it isn't that what you taught me (laughs) that's right when it when it comes to this when it comes to sports knowledge that we have man we were through with it before (laughs) everyone learned what to do with it and i love that speaking of being through with it before they knew what to do with it how about those 49ers on Sunday, Here, here's what I I noticed, and with them, I don't, I don't even look at Sunday's game, and I don't even look at last Saturday's game against the Vikings in the divisional round. That stretch they had, which actually started with the Packers, mm. <laughs> the, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes, it did. I, I I looked at that stretch when they played them, then they went to Baltimore, then they went to New Orleans. And they went two and one. And if it weren't for a field goal at the end of the Baltimore game, at the gun, they would have they would have been undefeated possibly in that three game stretch. When I saw them, and they had injuries, they were necked up, they were beat up, but the whole group was so dogmatic. They were they were determined, and they went through that stretch two and one. I, I, I was impressed. I was I was utterly impressed, and I was I was impressed with the with the L they took in Baltimore because they played the Ravens style. Mm-hmm. They played their style in their building. They hung with them. They played they them just, even. They just yeah. They played them even. The only difference was they just couldn't. They just didn't make that one play they needed. The Ravens yeah, did in that and, game. And, and that was the fourth down. Uh, that was the fourth down gamble that the Forty ers couldn't convert. They came up. Uh, Half a yard short. Baltimore took it, ran out the clock. But, hey, the 49ers are still standing, and now they get to go to Miami to claim their sixth Mm -hmm. Super Bowl. Right, and and to go along with that theme, they came out of that that, that part two and one, and I said to you, on air and off air, all they got to do is finish it off. When they go to Seattle and beat them, if they do that, I love their chances. What do they do? They go to CenturyLink, they win by what? (laughs) <laughs> three inches <laughs> but yep. hey, a win's a win doesn't matter how a you win, get it absolutely at that point a win's a win the 49ers get the, they get the they get the first round buy the they, they got mm-hmm. the buy they got the west title they got the number one seed and they got healthy and you and you know something even more so that well, any team would want to have the number one seed in their conference mm-hmm. so I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to shortchange that. What what they needed more than the the number one seed in the NFC was a buy because the they last time they had a off. buy, it was in October. So mm-hmm. they needed to lick wounds. So that buy was more important to them. And when they licked those wounds, and you saw <laughs> four and Alexander come back, when you saw that team become healthy, and I actually said it. In the division round, I said the team that I think they would love to see is the Vikings because I think they would they would be tailor made for the 49ers to beat. Mm-hmm. What did they do? They beat them up. 
<laughs> they just beat them up. They did. And then the Packers, who we saw back in November, yep. they beat them up. And when I when they got to the NFC the uh, NFC Championship game Sunday, I beat, figured they was gonna beat them up some more. They, they beat what them up they again. Do? They, they beat them up. They beat them up again. And they beat them up again. <laughs> so <laughs> if if I if, if I were to say that I was shocked and astonished, no, no. And in fact, the way they did it, I'm not shocked and astonished. In fact, I expected it, and it makes me happy to see that a team. A team won the way that they were built. Mm-hmm. You know, they are they are built to be physical up front on both sides of the ball. They're built to punish you on offense. They're built to be athletically better than you mm-hmm. and even phys- more physical than you on defense, especially with the front four. Absolutely. That's how they beat the Vikings. That's how they beat the Packers. And that's how they beat the and Seahawks. They're, and they're in Miami. That, that, that's yeah, how and they, that's how they beat the Seahawks in Week 17. Yep. Yeah. That's how they beat the Seahawks to earn that bye. They get healthy. Quan Alexander returns. D. Ford returns. The Vikings come into Levi's Stadium and they go, "Uh oh, they're fully healthy. We got problems." Mm-hmm. And Minnesota had a lot of problems in the divisional round. Yeah, they did. They did. They did. That was it. Was all they can to stay with them in the first half. Mm-hmm. And and and, one, and once they got out the tunnel of the third quarter, it was a wrap. <laughs> uh, it just was a wrap. And it, 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 but at least they could say they hung for a half with yep. the Packers. As soon as they touched the field, <laughs> it was done. And I, I said this to a friend of mine. Uh, shout out to my man, Christian Simpson, one of the brightest in his yes. minds that I know. Yes, love I him. said to him, yeah, I said to him, the, the 49ers, off the bus, once feet hit pavement into the stadium. I'm not talking about when they throw on the pads or the uniform or when they get on the field. Mm-mm. When feet hit pavement to the stadium, their goal is to run 200 yards against you on, a, on the ground. That's their goal. 200. <laughs> 200 <laughs> not a buck on the ground that's not, what we want to do not a buck and a half not a buck they want two no. bills and they want each two of bills the, on the ground each of these two playoff games they got two bills 200 against the yes. vikings and 280 against the packers and i got a good friend trey larkins uh one of the co-hosts of the wise guys that you can hear on arena sports net he is a big time packer fan and he said, he said, I don't care what happens. Aaron Rodgers is still the best quarterback, and Aaron Jones is still the best running back. And I texted him back, and I said, I hate to inform you of this, but you may have a good back, but the 49ers have three of them. Have three. <laughs> they have three. And last I checked, unless my math has severely fallen off since third grade, three is better than one. Especially if all three can gain at least 600 yards apiece. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, three is better than one. And it was proven Sunday. Yeah, it was. Because, at, you know, in the beginning, it looked like it, it looked like the game plan was to establish Coleman. Mm-hmm. But then, and, but then, Mostert caught on fire, and the Packers defense just couldn't. They didn't have an answer for him. Joe Buck, no said, it, him. Joe Buck said it best on the last 49er drive before the half. They cannot stop the run in reference to the Packers. They didn't stop it in November, and they sure as hell didn't stop it on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, and I, I figured that was their Achilles heel even before their their first matchup in November. Mm-hmm. It, and I'm like, yeah, that's going to be tough. You can't stop the run, and you're facing against the number one rushing offense in the NFC. Yep. Yeah, that's not <laughs> going to be a pretty picture for you. And and on top of that, people want to throw numbers at me saying, oh, Aaron Rodgers did this, and Aaron Rodgers did that. How about this? Aaron Rodgers is O for San Francisco in San Francisco. <laughs> how How about this as well? 32, 39, 321 yards, two touchdowns. Oh, two interceptions. Yep. That was a stat line <laughs> Sunday. And guess how many points the Packers ended up getting? 20. <laughs> 20. <laughs> so here's this bad man who actually threw for 300 <laughs> yards, and you saw how ineffective he was throughout mm-hmm. the whole entire game. And and how about and also how about this? 0-4 against the number one passing defense in his career in the playoffs. And this covers 15 seasons. I, Stephen A. so badly... Can we stop? 
Stephen A. so badly <laughs> wants to tout that bad man, and he's been bad, historically bad. He's old for San Francisco. Yeah. He hasn't beaten the number one pass defense in the playoffs. He threw two picks on Sunday, Emmanuel Mosley and, fittingly, Richard Sherman to close the deal. Mm-hmm. And the 49ers did on Sunday what they did in November. They got after the exact they, same thing. They they pinned their ears back and came after him. They did. The, it was it was almost as if Shanahan and and Salah just went with the game plan. They just dusted it off and mm-hmm. say, you know, what we did in November, we're gonna do that Sunday. I mean, because <laughs> it looked like it looked like the same game. It, it looked did. like the same game. It did. And and <laughs> it, it was it was it was for a for. A casual fan, you would say it was ugly because, well, you know, a, a team that loves to run, that's ugly. For football purists like you and me, a run game in the playoffs, that's one of the most beautiful things you could ever see. Man. Because it just, it's, 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 a, it's a sign of an offense saying to a defense, we're coming at you, buddy, come and stop me, and if you can't, we're going to demolish you. That I mean, is not, there is no more beautiful thing in the, in the, <laughs> for a football fan, a football purist to see, especially if it's your team, than your team basically saying, I'm more mad than you, and we proved it. Mm-hmm. Twice. <laughs> it's just straight in up. The, in this case, twice. Once in November, once in January. And I told all my, oh, Packer, it, I told all my Packer fans, if we see y'all in January, we're going to punch you in the mouth again. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, actually told, I actually told one of my friends, I said, it's not going to be like 37 to 8, <laughs> but I don't see this game being much better right. than that. Right. I see the Packers doing a little bit more, but they got nothing They got nothing to stop that, uh, that, that running attack for the 49ers. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will stop that 49ers running attack. Nothing. Which brings, they got nothing for it. Which brings me to this. Congrats to the Kansas City Chiefs for reaching the Super Bowl for the first time in 50 years, they claim the Lamar Hunt Trophy in their house against the Tennessee Titans. But the Chiefs are going to have some problems in two weeks facing Let me... this vaunted, and yes, I say vaunted, San Francisco rushing attack. If Jimmy Garoppolo throws less than 10 passes in the Super Bowl, which I have a distinct feeling he, he will throw less than 10 passes, Boy, Kansas City gonna have some issues. <laughs> now, now here's what could boost their confidence. Now, I don't really think the Chiefs' defense is all the way back. Mm-hmm. However, I, I, however, they they seem to be better than they were because they were going through a stretch like mid mid October to early early November when they they played a run of the AFC South opponents. They right. had the Colts at home, then they had the Texans at home, then they went to uh, Nashville to play the Titans. Yes. And each game that I just mentioned, the opponent, the Colts, the Texans, and the Titans respectively ran for at least 170 yards against them yep. on the ground. Yep. So, you know, my, my thought was, well, the Titans, if they have a chance, if they have a scintilla of hope, they would have to repeat what Derrick Henry has done the last three games before, which mm-hmm. is to run for at least 180 yards. Right. And I knew they would come up with a plan to limit him. I did not think it would be that they would play ball control to do it, which that to me was impressive. Yes. Uh, when I saw the Chiefs of 21-17 hold the ball nine minutes, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, so this is how they decided to sort of hamstring Derrick Henry's effect. Yep. Especially in the second half, that was one of the most brilliant moves because I wouldn't, I would have not have pictured them to do that. This, this fast break offense, I would have never pictured they would play keep away. Yeah, from a running offense, but that was brilliant. That was that was brilliant strategy. Absolutely. And and if the Chiefs do stand a chance to beat the 49ers, that's what they're going to have to do. They got to do that against the 49ers too. They're going to have to play keep away from that offense because once the 49ers get the ball in offense. I have said this on your air yep. just now. I have said it before. <laughs> I've said it on other people's air. I've said it on my own. The 49ers on offense want to punish you. They want to punish you and punish you and punish you some more. They do not believe that you can stop their three-headed monster. They don't believe it. <laughs> am I lying, sir? No, not at all. What have <laughs> I said on this program since April? You and I talked right after the 49ers drafted Nick Bosa 
and you asked, you know, how do you think the 49ers would win this year? My exact response was, see you in Miami. I said that on several programs, and people thought I was nuts. Well, see you in Miami. Now, I did not, I did not have the 49ers in Miami. I will cop to that. However, right. I didn't think they was going to. I didn't. I didn't think it was going to repeat four and twelve. I right. did not think that at right, all. Right, right, right. I, I, I figured the 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 move with uh, the the draft pick with Bosa, the 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 uh, free agent move to get Ford onto that defensive line. I figured, okay, well that defensive line looks really strong. Um, Sherman looks like he's healthy, so the secondary looks like it's being cemented. I did not know much about Alexander. I did not know much about him, but when I <laughs> saw the season go along, I was like, doggone, man, the linebacking core is being sewn up by the yep. by the middle linebacker here. I'm like, doggone, this defense is this defense is bad. And I don't mean bad isn't bad, I mean bad isn't good. Yep. And <laughs> and then my thought was, well, the defense is good. That team is gonna and I've said this to I said this to you from August. That team is going to go as far as Jimmy Garoppolo could, could take them. And when I said that to people, people thought I was talking about what well, he needed to throw uh-huh. 25, 30, 300 yards, four touchdowns, no yep. interceptions. Yep. No. No, I meant he would lead the team however the team needed to be led. If it meant that he had to throw 300 yards, he could do that. If it meant that he only throws eight passes, he could do that. <laughs> as long as the team wins, that's all that matters. And that's all I cared about with mm-hmm. him. And, and if he did how he has been, and I figured he was. I figured if if he would limit his mistakes, I remember I said to you, you did. I they were like four or five and zero, oh, but I was seeing a lot of mistakes by him. I yes. said he needs to curb that. If he curbs that, that team can go to Miami. But if he doesn't curb it, that's going to cost him. Mm-hmm. And I'd be doggone if he fixed that problem and he did not turn the ball over as much and nope. he didn't turn the ball over but once in the two games in the playoffs. Right. So uh, that. It, the, the team is absolutely phenomenal. How they are, how how they are structured, because they can beat you however you want. As the Saints, as the Saints found out, because yep. the Saints were like, okay, well, um, you you're not going to try to beat us running. You can probably you get some yards on us running, but you're not going to beat us running. Okay, fine. And Garoppolo <laughs> threw over. <laughs> so, so what is so what does Garoppolo do in New Orleans? Oh, he just hangs 349 yards. Right. So. <laughs> you know, so that team is built to beat a, a, another squad in NFL, however they so desire. Whatever you take away from them, they will beat you the other way. Mm-hmm. So if you want to take the run from them, fine, and they'll still run on you and still run effectively on you. But if you're going to take it away from them the way they don't run 45 times, where they just run maybe 25 to 30, okay, that just means they'll throw 30 times and be yep. more effective. Yep. If you're gonna do like what the the, the Packers <laughs> the Packers did, and it's like okay, Garoppolo, you're not gonna complete any passes to Debo Samuel and Emmanuel Sanders, and and you definitely not gonna get George Kittle off. Okay, <laughs> we'll just hand the ball off 45 times. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. You pick your poison, however you want to get your butt whooped. That is how the 49ers will, will beat you, and that's impressive. You really have teams that can beat you that way. Ever. Look at how they got the ball into Debo Samuel's hands. So they took the mm-hmm. pass. They took the passing game away. The Packers did, but the 49ers said, "You know what? We're going to put this passing game on the shelf, and we're going to put the ball. We're going to put the ball in all of our playmakers' hands, running it." Debo Samuel, two carries, yep. 46 yards yesterday. I, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been, been a fan of the hey, 49ers we, hey, since 81. I've seen Roger Craig, Wendell Tyler, Amos Lawrence, Ricky Waters, uh, Tom Rathman, William Floyd. But Sunday? Wow. I mean, it, it, it just goes to show. You mentioned all of those wonderful names in 49er lore, which, well, I mean, their successful playoff run started in 81. Now, yes. they've had some playoffs. They had some playoff success even before then. But all of that, and none of them can claim that they ran as much as this 49er <laughs> as team. <Raheem> Monster <laughs> did Sunday. That should tell you how beautiful and how um, important a performance that Mozart put together Sunday. That it would be the best a 49ers ever done on the ground in the history of the franchise. Yes. 29 for 220 and four touchdowns yesterday. Three, he had 160 yards by halftime. 
160 yards and three touchdowns by halftime. By the time they walk to the locker room, yep. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> uh, and I was like, oh man, game over. Game set. <laughs> what, match. It don't even matter how the Packers come back in the second half. This game's over. You know what? <laughs> I, I got to share this story. This was wild yesterday. Um, doing some catch, go, doing some uh, catch up work on Sunday. Um, wife and I are sitting here in in the office. We got the we we got the game on, and she dozed off. But then she looked to her left where the television is and saw that it was twenty seven to nothing. She got up and mm-hmm. said, "Honey, I'm going to bed. This game's over." Smart woman. Smart woman. <laughs> she got up and said, "This." She got up and said, "This game's over." And when the final when when the final gun happened. I got up and I went to bed and I watched the celebration from bed because the game mm-hmm. was in the game was in the book. If you want, if y'all want to really think about it, yeah. the game was in the book once the 49ers took the lead seven to nothing. The game was in the book Pretty much. because Pretty much. they pinned their ears and came after Rogers. And oh, by the way, Rogers turned the ball over yeah. three times. Mm-hmm. The fumble turned into a touchdown. And I had I got so many friends at work that saying, well, we uh, after the um, the game in November, I had so many of my friends saying, well, we stopped George Kittle. We only limited him to one catch. Yeah, here's the problem. It went for 61 yards and a touchdown. <laughs> OK. And, they, uh, and like I said earlier, you can you can try to stop one of them, but you can't you stop, all, stop of all of them. Because it's, it's like gonna be someone else is going to hurt you. It's like that 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 tweet you sent me Monday morning of Jerry Rice at age fifty seven, folks, still running that slant mm. and doing it well. How do you look pretty? Mm. <laughs> I, I seriously thought I seriously thought I'm like, oh, he must, he must be tr- um, coming off that ACL injury because it looked <laughs> like it was thirty years ago. Because I mean, he looked like he ran that slant. I'm like, oh my gosh, that he, dude has muscle memory because he did it so smooth. He ran it for <laughs> 16 years with not one but two Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Two. Yep. Two Hall he of Fame quarterbacks. Two quarterbacks Hall of Fame. Yep. yep. Steve Steve Young was on Steve Young was on the sideline. Jerry Rice was on the sideline. You think the Bay Area wasn't amped up for this NFC Championship game? And folks, the last time the Packers and the 49ers met in the NFC title game. A, it was at Candlestick Park. B, Brett Favre was the starting quarterback. And C, the Packers actually won 23 to 10. You didn't get a 1997. Yeah. And the 49ers were the number one seed in 1997. You didn't yes, get were. any sense of that. Even though Stephen A loves to say Aaron Rodgers is such a bad man, well, the bad man on Sunday was Raheem Mostert with 220 well, yards. No. Well, well, actually, no. Well, Stephen A. was right because that bad man was a bad man for real. <laughs> he was no <laughs> different thinker. And 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 I, and I actually said this in, in in circles. I said, you know what the 49ers need to do, and that's exactly what they did. Run the they football, said, uh, Aaron. Yeah, well, they had to run the football, but on defense, Aaron Jones, you may get some carries. But we're going to try to limit you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Devontae Adams, you'll probably get some catches, but you know what? You're not going to beat us. Nope. Because you know who's going to beat us? Number 12. We're going to force number 12 to beat us. And he didn't. And when, and he didn't. And when have you ever heard anyone say that the game plan should be Aaron Rodgers has to beat you? Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it Sunday. And then Aaron Rodgers throws over 300 yards and doesn't even come close to beating you. Nope. So it just goes. And then let me shout out this offense. This, this, well, shout out the offensive line, the, the 49ers as well, because man, they they're bouncers, man. They 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 just they just they, they just throw people out of club. Mm-hmm. But but that that defensive front, I'm so in awe of those four. That front four to the point where, oh, uh, to the point where, oh gosh, Arsenal, Buckner, Bosa, Ford, they don't need to have another person rush with them. Nope. They can rush four all game long, and they make the life of offensive linemen horrible. Yes. They make the life of quarterbacks horrible. And I'm thinking to myself, how is it they consistently beat offensive lines <laughs> to where they can get the quarterback down on the turf three, four, five times a game? And I'm like, and they don't do blitzes. I'm like, 
What you, is they doing on that front? Do you know? I'm, I'm, you want a number? Ooh. You know I dig. You know I dig in the numbers. I use my eyes, but I also dig in the numbers. How about this? The last three games, going back to Week 17, you know how many times the 49ers blitzed? Once, and that was Sunday. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, the, I bet you that number is, if I'd be surprised, I'd, say, I'd be surprised if it was five. <laughs> every time I, every time I look, because I, I didn't watch all of Sunday's game, I saw I saw the highlights of it. Right. Above, above, above the first half, for sure. But the Almost every game I saw the 49ers on defense this year, I don't think I ever saw them blitz once. Nope. And even if they brought somebody else, which in the Vikings game they did, mm-hmm. they brought I can't remember it was I can't remember which linebacker they brought because it wasn't Alexander, but they, they brought a linebacker. They had Bosa go back in coverage. Yep. <laughs> and, when, and when you know it, they threw in Bosa's direction, and Bosa defended the pass like he was yep. like he was a safety. And it, it, it was like, th- this is impressive. This is impressive how athletic that whole defensive line is and how that, that defensive front seven is and how that scheme is to where they say we are only going to rush four. And sometimes we'll rush three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we still get mm-hmm. your quarterback. I mean, they rushed three a couple times in the November game against Green Bay, and they still got him. Matter of fact, mm-hmm. first series of the game. First series of the game. They rush three, they get to Rodgers, fumble, and the 49ers take it in a play later. I just, I, I, I'm, 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 just, I'm just in awe at how physically dominant this mm-hmm. team is. Oh, yeah. And, 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 and I said, I, I think I said this in other circles, I didn't say this to you, but the only team I thought that would have given the 49ers fits would have been the Seahawks. Yes. Only because... They know the 49ers better than any other team this year. Correct. Besides them, I said if they if they avoid, and I'm not saying the 49ers would want to not play them. They probably would love to play them because they love the physicality and they the would love to bring not, it. They would love to knock them around again the same way they knocked them yeah. around the Century Lake Field in week in week 17. And because, had they faced right. the Seahawks a third time, they'd have, they'd have punched them in the mouth. Because I think they, they did, I, I think the be, I, I think the Seahawks would have won the game. I mean, not Seahawks. The Forty Nineers would have won the game, but it would not, it would have been a lot closer than yeah than thirty seven to twenty Vikings <laughs> and the game they played against the Packers. Because in my in my estimation, and I actually said this, I said, man, if 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 the Forty Nineers could could tailor make their run to the Super Bowl, they played the, they played the Vikings, then they played the Packers mm-hmm. because those two teams are tailor made for the Forty Nineers to beat. Yeah, and you know they get can they get Kansas City again. Kudos for Kansas City in, in, in making the Super Bowl. But my biggest question is going to be how is Kansas City going to handle that ferocious pass rush? Here's how they're going to have to handle it, and 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 the thing is they don't have it as strong as they should. The only way you can calm that defensive front. It's if you have a running game that is solid enough to do so. And Damian Williams, all respect to you, my brother. Yes. But, uh, no, you, you, you just don't do it enough. It's, you know, you're not, you're not that difference maker as a back. You know, if you were like Kareem Hunt was, maybe. But you're not that guy. So... The, the the Chiefs have to find a way to run, and if they if they have to actually make Patrick Mahomes himself run, mm-hmm. they're gonna have to do that. They're gonna have yeah. to move that pocket yep. because that's the only way I could see the Chiefs stymie at least to a small degree that pressure that's gonna come up front. Because if not, if Mahomes is gonna be in that pocket, he's gonna be sitting duck. Yep, it, it might as well it might as well be a defensive line drill. <laughs> because that's exactly what I've been seeing the last two games when it comes to any offense going up against that defensive front for the 49ers. It, it's, it has literally looked like a defensive line drill. Like a, a, it says the center is a defensive back coach or a defensive line coach. He's, he's playing center. He snaps the ball. And each, and each guy, they just, they just take turns doing bull rushes, clubs, spins. They just take their turn learning how to do or getting the feel to do different moves <laughs> to get to that five foot yep. pillow that's standing eight yards behind the line of scrimmage. Mm-hmm. 
that is what I that's what I have been seeing the last two games. And, and I don't if see, the Chiefs do that with Mahomes, I'm gonna see the third. And, and I don't see Robert Sala changing his scheme. I don't see him blitzing. I don't think he'll he have shouldn't. to. He, he, he shouldn't have to. No, he should. He shouldn't have to. He, he shouldn't have to. I mean, kudos to Patrick Mahomes. Don't get me wrong, but mm-hmm. and and you know what? This is what I. This is the comparison that I love to make, and I'm going to continue to make it. You know who Patrick Holmes m- reminds me of that the 49ers can use to get themselves ready for Miami? A young Russell Wilson. Yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. He, Mahomes doesn't run as much, but he may need to run a little more mm-hmm. <laughs> come, come, <laughs> come the Sunday after next. Because, uh, I mean, look, Mahomes can throw in tight windows. There's no question about that. Absolutely. He has a great arm. He has a yeah. he has a great mind for the game. Yes, he can throw defenses off. True, but I but I I don't think he is playing defense that is so diverse to where and so ferocious because, and so ferocious to where because the way Mahomes plays they they're baiting you to bring a blitz mm-hmm. so that they can just beat you over the top. And the Forty Nineers are not a defense where you can do that all that often to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it, as proven in Sunday's game, Rodgers only did it once because the second time he tried, <laughs> that ball fell to the arms of one Richard Sherman. So, I mean, <laughs> this is not a team you can bomb and throw over the top of. So uh, and so y- you can't really dare in the blitz. And then when they rush, they're rushing enough to where you still have seven, if not eight, covering <laughs> all of your guys downfield. So yep. How are you going to fit it unless you're going to just – Check down and dump it off, and check down and dump it off. And then, if that's the case, you might see one of those defensive linemen pick pick the ball off and run for six, mm-hmm. as Bosa's done earlier this year. Yeah. So, I mean, that to me is the dilemma of the, for the Chiefs. They're gonna have to find a way to successfully attack successfully attack that defensive front. And I think if they can attack the defensive front, they may have a better shot of stymieing the defense as a whole. Yeah. But that front four, Ooh. that's where it starts and that's where it ends for the 49ers because it makes the other seven they, – they, all they got to do is do their job. They don't mm-hmm. even have to concern about that's holding it. a guy longer than five seconds. They don't have to concern themselves with with seeing somebody leak out in the flat and t- cover so much ground if you're the linebacking core. No. And they don't have to and, – and most times they don't even have to worry about a quarterback uh, tucking the ball in and running. Because they probably can handle that. Mm-hmm. The, the, like I said, the only way I could see the Chiefs actually trying to do something that could maybe help their cause is like, like you said, if they could do a, uh, if, if if Mahomes could do a, a Russell Wilson impersonation, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. This is Snowman in the Morning, where true sports talk lives. He did what? I did not need to be told that. Hey, folks, don't forget to check us out on our social media, the ID you need for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and Snapchat is SITM 9 to noon. That's SITM, the number 9, T O. N O O N. Now it's time for me to welcome Russ Williams as we continue our series of Transition Tuesdays. He joins me right now on the hotline. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, Snowman. How are you, sir? I am doing great. Uh, flying into 2020. Last week we talked about transitioning into 2020. What's on the docket this week? We are going to talk about transitioning to your higher height. All right. And uh, that's Let's... yeah, you know, everybody wants to do the, make that transition to higher heights. You never want to be stagnant, and uh, love to talk about that. The transition to your higher heights, whatever higher heights that might be for each and each and every one of us. All right, you. I know you have your GPSs ready. Let's hit it. Absolutely, yes. There are two GPSs I'm going to share today. Uh, GPS is short for Game Plan Steps that everyone should remember when transitioning to your higher heights. GPS number one, you have to develop a confident mindset. Uh, And when I say confident, 
being confident and being cocky are two different things. So you have to develop a confident mindset. So, Snowman, are you a fan of hip hop by chance? I am indeed, sir. Okay, I am. A, I am a huge fan of hip hop. I consider myself a hip hop baby, and uh, one of my favorite rappers, and he's one of the most confident rappers out there, is Kanye West. Yes, and he came out. Yeah, and he came out with one of the great lines, displaying his confidence and talking about having a confident mindset. He he's been on. He's quoted as saying. He says, I'm trying to get that Kobe number one over Jordan. Now, you know, <laughs> that's a confident statement. That's one confident statement. Then he had another confident statement. I, I clean it up for the viewers. He just, and the, and the listeners, he says, he says, I'm the number two and the urine. So he's saying he's both things. <laughs> so this is confident. You have to have that confident mindset when you're transitioning to whatever higher heights you aspire to be. So that's the first GPS. Mm hmm. Second GPS is know that you have enough, you are enough, and you have enough to reach your highest heights. That's so important because today, this very day, you have enough to achieve higher heights or to transition to higher heights. I think of it, I, I always say it like this, though, man, as long as you have breath and you're breathing today and you're living today, you can be an asset to somebody and you can be an asset to yourself. And also, people have to remember that you're also worthy to reach your high heights. You know, a lot of times people get into the rut of, hey, I, I messed up last week. You know, I, I can't transition to higher heights. No, no, that's in the rear view mirror. You have to get past that. We're all worthy enough to do it. And we have enough to do it. Case right. in point, Snowman, you know, my, my, my throat's been killing me a little bit. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I, I was like, man. Do I have enough to to get on, you know, for the segment, for Transition Tuesdays? Then I thought about it, I said, yes. Matter of fact, I know I have enough to do, and I know I'm worthy enough to have, you know, and, and fortunate enough to have a segment on your show, Snowman in the Morning, you know, Transition Tuesdays. So that's how I really look about it. So, you know, you again, you have enough, and you are enough to reach your highest heights when you're transitioning to your higher heights, whatever heights that you, you aspire to be or become. Well, there's a couple of higher heights that I've already reached and both involve my beautiful wife, Dr. K. When I met her, I was at my lowest point, as I told you on your show a few weeks back. Uh -huh. All she had, all she has to do is just find some way to make me smile. And she does that every day. And I'm flying higher than a kite for that entire day. And yes, wow. we both have, um, fought depression and we are uh, fighting depression i mean we were going through through it something bad when we got down here but as you mentioned in transitioning to your higher heights you have to realize that you are enough and that you are worthy and we reaffirm to each other that we are worthy for each other and we're not going to let this depression knock us off of what we are trying to do here in the year 2020 and mm -hmm. the other thing is she reminds me when I do get down, she reminds me every day that I am enough for her as she is for me. And, mm. and, and yeah, I love I love talking about her. I know she gets flustered. She's looking at me right now through the glass and she's got this big smile on her face and she's blushing a little bit. But I just hope she understands and continues to understand on a daily basis and a moment by moment basis what she means to me. And gentlemen, I have to say this. When you find that one special person that can pick you up and continue to pick you up on a daily basis and on a moment by moment basis, that is a keeper. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And the great thing about it, so man, you guys are doing it together. You guys aren't out there on a limb by yourselves. You're doing it together, and you you guys are reaching those higher heights. That, that is phenomenal, I, I'm, and I appreciate you for sharing that, Snowman. You know, you brought up hip-hop and Kanye West, and when we talked mm -hmm. on your show, you know I'm a basketball head, and you know I'm an old-school NBA head. Well, people yeah. who know me or know of me know that my favorite player of all time War had just happened to wear the number 23. His name is Michael Jordan. Yes. And he said yes, something uh -huh. in his Hall of Fame speech that is so very, very true. When he said, 
limits like fears are often just an illusion. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I like that too. And it's funny you mentioned Michael Jordan because remember the the first GPS I mentioned to you to develop a confident mindset. Yes. And I share this and I share this with you, Snowman, and your listeners. So when I got recruited from Manhattan College, I uh, you know signed there, played the first year. Second year, my the coach who recruited me was fired. So a new regime came in. Steve Lapis, who went on to coach, he was at Villanova, he coached the man in Manhattan, then he coached on the Villanova fame. But he came on board and he recruited, you know, he recruited over everybody that was there who, who remained in the program. And me being the confident person I am, I saw the writing on the wall. I knew I was being over-recruited and I knew it was going to be a situation in which I might not be able to play a lot my sophomore year. But me being my confident self, and me thinking about, like, your favorite player, I said to myself this, though, man. I said, hey, if my only way I'm not going to play in this program, if Michael Jordan comes, goes back to North Carolina, has more eligibility and transfer to Manhattan College. Love it. If he doesn't do that, I'm playing in this program. <laughs> so I went on to, you know, the funny thing about that, I always share that story with people, you know, Michael Jordan not having – you know, he, he wouldn't have any more eligibility, nor would he transfer to Manhattan College. But, you know, but I took that confident mindset. Hey, look, you know, I know this guy's going to be here do that. I'm confident enough in my abilities, and it turned out great for me because, I, you know, I had a great career at Manhattan College, and I was able enough to be uh, elected into the Athletic um, Hall of Fame at Manhattan College. So you have to have that confident mindset. And that story that you shared about Michael Jordan, that just made me remind me of the story that I have about Michael Jordan that I talk about a lot in terms of being confident in your abilities. <laughs> what do you think knocks people down from their confident abilities? Because this is something I have struggled with over the years, especially uh, since I became a broadcaster. You have days mm -hmm. where everything's flowing great. You know, the day's flying by, you're getting, st you're getting stuff done. Um, but then you have days that just tend to just tend to knock you off and it knocks you yeah. off stride. How tough is it to keep that confident mindset? My first question and my backup question is, how do you keep that confident mindset? Well, I think I think what knocks us off the pedal sometimes is that fear factor. I just the, just the fear of it all. And I think what we have to do is just like have, have to fight through that fear. I know it's tough to do that. And fear can be that emotion that you really puts people over the top in terms of not accomplishing their goals and, and their dreams. But I think if you face the fear, but you have to keep on keeping on, keep on trudging, get past that fear factor, because the fear factor won't last long. And when you approach the fear factor, not to run away from it, but approach it, you'll be able to get past it and through it to the goal in which you're trying to achieve. So I would say first thing is, again, face that fear. Fear is the one that that's the big elephant in the room that, 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 that hinders us for our goals. Face it. Know that it's there, but you can't get past it. You know, it's not going to last long. Get past that. And then you'll be able to, to subscribe to higher heights. I really, I truly believe that you get past the fear factor. You're on your way to success. It's the Transition Tuesday. You can hear us every Tuesday with Russ Williams as he shares his transition steps into 2020 and beyond. Tell everybody where they can find you, my friend. Yes, absolutely. Um, I can be found on Twitter on R World Transition. That's R W I L L T R A N S I T I O N. That's on Twitter. On Instagram, I can be found at R World Transitions with an S. And if you have it, um, reach out to me on Facebook. Please reach out to me as a Facebook friend at Russ Williams. And, again, I'm here to assist everybody. Like I tell everybody all the time, Snowman, I scored a lot of points in college, but I'm here to assist everybody on their transitional journey. So I'm here to help. Russ Williams joins me every Tuesday for Transition Tuesdays. Check him out on Facebook every Tuesday night. He always has a great time. I was a guest, and I hope one day you can share your story of your transition as well. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. He mentioned something that is so true, and it's something that I fight 
almost on a daily basis. And I say almost because I'm starting to get over this very critical hump. And that's the fear factor. You heard him mention that towards the end of the interview. What is the biggest fear? My wife and I have been listening. Well, my wife more than I. Um, we got into listening to some positive messages uh, from Jack Canfield. And he mentioned the exact same thing that uh, Russ Williams mentioned. And that is the fear factor. Is it the fear that's holding you back? Well, I can honestly admit that it's been the fear of failure that has held me back. Note the uh, tense, held me back. And I say held me back because there's it's not going to hold me back anymore. Is it a daily process? You better believe it is. Is it a daily grind? You better believe it is. But if you can get over that fear and you get over that fear by doing the one thing that you fear every day. For me, it's advertising sales. It's advertising sales or finding the right person because of some stuff that happened before. It's uh, finding the right person to bring into my organization, my wife's organization. It's it's that right it's that right person. It's finding that right person to help you get over your fear so you can move forward. Take a pause for a break, and when we come back, I got another guest. Snowman in the morning, back in a flash. This is Snowman in the morning. Where true sports talk lives. He did what? I did not need to be told that. The Tuesday edition of Snowman in the Morning continues. Hey, if you want to sponsor this here program, all you have to do is drop an email to my new address. It is snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. That's snowmandigitalmedia at gmail.com. You can sponsor this program as well as my NBA podcast, Snowman Unfiltered, and a couple of other programs that I have in the works. So check it out, Snowman Digital Media at gmail.com. And the full website, Snowman Digital Media, will make its debut the day after the Super Bowl. Got a little more work to put into it. Now I want to welcome a fellow who just premiered his show uh, yesterday, Monday, and I'm having fun listening to it. I mean, he he he's do, he does great work, and he's also a play-by-play announcer, so a man after my own heart. This is Desmond Johnson, and he joins me right now. DJ, how are you doing, my friend? Good, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. You got to tell me how the rundown happened. Tell me how that came to be. Um, So about, well, really, we just had our second year anniversary uh, Monday, uh, January the 20th. Um, back in the end of 2017, uh, I'm here in the Greensboro High Point Winston Salem area, and there's only one sports radio cluster here, and that's WSGS Sports Hub. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the time, I was doing some high school football for them a little bit here and there, but uh, radio has kind of just been in my blood since college, and I've kind of gone away from it, came back, gone away from it, came back, and somewhere along that year, I decided I was just going to go full force in the radio. So I started working at IMG uh, College doing uh, studio hosting for uh, Charlotte, their football and basketball teams mm-hmm. uh, during the season through IMG. We got a little bit more of a taste, you know, with all that and everything. So uh, one of the guys that worked over there uh, by the name of Kyle Schatzberger, he's actually the studio host for Duke. Um, he was also at the same time the programming director at WSJS. So he invited me to start coming on to his show that he was running in the afternoons, like once uh, a month, like on Thursdays when he was on a remote. So I was doing that for a little bit. And then um, towards the end of the year, I had been pitching an idea to do a show, um, like a Saturday morning show that would be more of a panel format, kind of like, you know, like LeBron James show, The Shop. That was kind of the general idea that we pitched where Mm -hmm. it was like, we want to do kind of like a barbershop show setting but it would be scripted and it would be with uh stuff that had gone on during the week and then getting the listeners ready for what was about to happen after we went off the air mm-hmm. on uh during the weekend so we we pitched that to them negotiated with them they decided to let us come on board and it became an hour-long saturday morning show from 10 to 11 on saturdays uh for the first year 
after we got through the first year, we expanded to two hours and we were on. Um, and during that time, I became the programming director and uh, picked back up high school football again. So I was doing a lot of different things. I was producing uh, the afternoon show that they have now that they relaunched. And um, th- due to budget cuts, uh, I was let go in November of uh, this past year, 2019. But we had already been doing some stuff freelancing on our own. And we had a couple of terrestrial stations call or, you know, inquire about the rundown. And we thought about moving it to a different station. But in the end, uh, for me, it was more of a no brainer to say, you know, why don't we just skip traditional radio entirely and go to where everybody listens to their stuff today anyway, which is on their hip, you know, it's in their pockets, their phone. And it's less expensive. If you know what you're doing, you can still produce a quality show that way. And um, we decided to go that route. And that was back in November when we decided to go that route. And today, well, not today, but uh, yesterday, Monday was the season premiere of uh, of the Rundown with Desmond Johnson. And we're technically on a bigger platform than ever. And uh, we're, we're just enjoying what we're doing. You know something? You and I share a very common denominator skip the middleman and go to the ma- and go to the masses uh where'd you go to school um i'm a proud spartan i graduated from unc greensboro uh in 2003 from their media uh their media studies department love it i used to live in greensboro back in uh 1995 oh, okay. 1996 so i'm familiar with the greensboro coliseum the acc tournament and everything around there that was my first taste of north carolina Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, now that we're talking, now that we're talking shop, and where, who do you cover to do play by play for? Um, we had a uh, we were doing high school football for uh, East Forsyth, uh, which I'm alma mater to uh, here in Kernersville. Um, I graduated from there in '96, and they have one of the better football programs in the entire state. They're back to back four A state champs. They just won. Uh, in December over Cardinal Gibbons out of Raleigh. And uh, they're, they're two-time defending state champions. They're right here under our nose in Kernersville. I'm alumni. Rod Funderburg, who does the rundown with me, he does color commentary with that as well. And uh, originally we had him on SJS. I pitched it to the station mm-hmm. to run all of the precise season. And I was like, it's a no-brainer. We're in Kernersville. They're in Kernersville. It's right down the street. They haven't lost the game in like two years or whatever. Um, and when you're looking for somebody to, f- to cover in high school football, they're right here. And it was like pulling teeth, to be honest, uh, to get them to commit to to do just East Forsyth. And then when they let me go in November, literally the first thing I did when I walked out of the building was contact the athletic director at East Forsyth and negotiated out a deal for, for my media company to exclusively carry the rest of East Forsyth's schedule and into the playoffs, uh, which they gladly did. And then um, luckily for me, they made it all the way to the state championship and won. And from that, we kind of brokered a deal where next year uh, we'll be brought, we'll be the exclusive provider for East Forsyth football as they go for three um, in Class 4A in North Carolina. So we're super excited about that, too. What's been the biggest challenge for you when, since you've uh, stepped down on your own? Um, this, well, this isn't the first time I've stepped out on my own. I've done some things in the past, like uh, I used to run a digital marketing service back in the day and some other things, but um, I think the most challenging thing is making sure you're surrounding yourself with the right people. Like I learned a lesson from the last time I did this, that the people I had around me, they weren't aligned with my goals or what I wanted. So when this happened this time and I found myself in a situation where I could kind of choose what I wanted to do, it was really more of a sign of relief because now it's like, okay, I've been pushing off things I've been wanting to do Mm -hmm. for the sake of the station. And now I'm not there with them, but they just, unknowingly trained me on how to do everything in the station over the past year from sales to programming to promo on air every i was doing everything for them so when i left i felt more comfortable about options to do things on my own um and so now there's some things i have in the works with uh netcastsports.com uh they're an online provider of like aau prep sports uh semi-pro things and we've been working loosely already. So they're on board. They're actually our, our, one of our partners with the rundown in terms of getting it out, uh, social media wise and, uh, and producing it on that end. And then just making sure I had people around me that had specific roles and knew what they were doing and were good at it and actually have that this time around. So it makes it more where, 
think there's a lot more open opportunities than it would have been if this had happened to me two or three years ago. Um, like we just expect to grow and grow through the year. Can I just throw my hat in the ring to be a part of this party? Because I'm, I'm having fun doing, I'm having fun doing this show, and it was, it, it's great meeting you and and, and talking to you. Um, as I said at, at the top of this hour, the toughest thing for me, uh, the biggest fear factor for me was getting over sales, getting over my fear of doing sales rather. And I'm starting to feel, yeah. I'm starting to feel that confidence again. But what I want to do is. May, I, I told my wife this several hundred times over, and she believes in me every day that I said it and say it every time that I say it. I want to turn this into my full time paycheck, not just doing my show, but doing right. play by but doing play by play. And then, I mean, you and you and I start talking, and you start talking about distributing not only this show but the other shows that I have in the works under Snowman Digital Media, and my eyes light up. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the thing that while I was at WSGS, I started doing this podcast network. Um, I own SportsTalkOnMonthly.com, which is basically a 24-hour regional website that focuses on ACC Big Four, uh, the Hornets, the Panthers, NASCAR, Hurricanes, anything that's Central North Carolina-related uh, prep sports, uh, we, we handle it there. But over the past year or so, we started doing more and more things audio-wise, like with podcasting mm-hmm. and um, producing podcasts and inviting people on who are already doing podcasts to come onto the network. So there's everything from we were doing a coaching show for the East for Sci-Fi coach every week. Uh, we have a racing podcast that's dedicated to Bowman Gray Stadium out in Winston-Salem, who have a very rabid, devoted fan base of 19,000 people that are sitting there every Saturday during the season. And... Um, that that podcast did extremely well. Yeah, uh, I have contributors from IMG and from uh, guys that love WWE that do a podcast, and it, you know it turned into something pretty cool. And I realized, well, hell, we can actually do this uh, on a larger scale. Which by the spring, we're actually looking at building an online digital uh, sports radio network that would include these podcasts and things like your show, like Snowman in the Morning and stuff like that, where we'd have a full fledged schedule um going on uh the sales thing it's funny you mentioned that because i come from sales i, I don't particularly care to do it i'd rather be producing content same but, here uh, same I, here i agree <laughs> with i agree with that one man <laughs> the key the key the key with that i've learned is to find people that can sell yes that you can kind of toss some content their way and they'll go sell it for you and that's what i've kind of done this time around was to make sure i had a couple of guys that could actually go sell um, and then I still have to go out and do it myself. That's just the nature of being, you know, yeah. self-employed. But, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, that's probably the most daunting thing is the, the sales thing because that's a relationship you have to build with businesses yep. over time before they'll give you money. Mm-hmm. Um, and the content has to be good. Like, you know, all that comes hand in hand. It really does. It really does. Desmond Johnson, the man in charge of Sports Carolina Monthly, joining me and also the host of the rundown it's a fantastic show folks i encourage you to check it out if you log on to sports carolina monthly.com i will be a faithful listener just like i hope you'll be a faithful listener of snowman in the morning and i can't wait to get this show on sports carolina monthly and i mean that yeah and uh, if for anyone that wants to check out the rundown it's live noon to 1 p.m uh during the week right now we're monday wednesday friday but eventually that'll go to five days a week um, it's basically a, a great way to spend your lunch. It doesn't take very long to get to it. You can either go to Sports Carolina Monthly's Facebook or Twitter, or you can go to Netcast Sports Facebook or Twitter, and there's a live player embedded into the, the news feed. So even if you don't go to our website, if you just follow us on social media and uh, the player pops up in your news feed, just hit the little speaker button and boom, you're already in there. Uh, today's episode's already up there. And uh, the podcast portion of it will be on Spotify, Google Play, Apple, uh, iTunes, and whatnot uh, here real shortly, actually. I'm in the middle of working on it right now, and that will be posted every day as well. It's just Beautiful. A recap of what's going on in sports and, you know, what's, what's going on and a couple of guys basically in there discussing what's been happening. Yep. And uh, I, like I said, I can't wait to put this show on your podcast network, my man. Make, in, make the audience yeah. even bigger. Make the audience even bigger. Yeah, Looking forward to it, man, for sure. Looking forward to it as well. Thank you, DJ. Appreciate the time. All right. Thank you. Pause for a break. Got more stuff for you after this.
This is Snowman in the Morning. Hadouken! Where true sports talk lives. He did what? I did not need to be told that. Welcome back to the program. It's now time to talk some NBA basketball. I'm going to try to make this a consistent part of the program. And I want to welcome Mr. Chris Pirtle, my uh, good friend and an NBA insider to the program. How are you, my friend? Doing good, Brian. Good to be with you today. Good to be with you as well. I mean, Chris has been a very dear friend. Uh, he loves talking NBA basketball with me. So let's get down. Let let's get down to it. And uh, the All Star break is coming. Have you seen any surprises or uh, big time disappointments? Uh, not necessarily. You know, one of the things I predicted going into the season, Brian, that Demontis Sabonis would be a first-time All-Star this season, and it looks like that is going to happen. Uh, had his first career triple-double last night in Denver as the Pacers got their fifth win in a row mm-hmm. uh, at the Denver Nuggets. Not an easy place to get uh, a fifth win in a row. Tonight they'll go to Utah, so it, the road gets tougher for the Pacers, but right now an impressive team, and happy to see that my prediction of DeMontis Sabonis uh, looks like it's going to come true. That is absolutely wonderful. I'm a fan of the big man Sabonis. He's really, really put a good season together. Early on, when we had a chance to talk before the season tipped off, you said that Luka Doncic would be competing for MVP, and it seems like you're on the mark with that. Yeah, even through a uh, slight injury issue where he missed – uh, several games, uh, g- games in which the Mavericks actually were pretty impressive. They won at Philadelphia and won at Milwaukee without Luka, uh, but he did have to miss about four or five games at that stretch, but has rebounded quite nicely. And, man, I love his game, Brian. You know, I watched him. I was at my hotel room in Warner Robins, Georgia, this past Friday night making my way back to Florida and had the pleasure of being able to sit down and watch a full NBA game, which I don't always get to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I got to watch the complete game between the Blazers and the Mavericks that night, and the back and forth between Lillard, who we already know is a winner, a true competitor, an all-star, a great one of the game, against Luka, and they were just going back and forth. The Mavericks prevailed at home. Uh, But what a matchup it was, and what a player Luka is. In my mind, uh, Brian, I have to give him the MVP. I you know, Giannis's numbers are even better than last season when he won the MVP, so it's hard not to give it to Giannis. In addition, the Milwaukee Bucks are on a historic streak right now with their record and, and possibly closing in on 70 games. So I'm sure most people will want to give it to Giannis, but not me, because when you're averaging close to a triple-double with 29 points, you have to be the MVP. I don't care if you're in your second year or your 17th year. That is so true. Luka Doncic has been playing out of sight this year. There's one team in the East, before we start, let's start breaking down teams now. There's one team in the East that you and I have spoken about from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. And that inconsistent team is the Philadelphia 76ers. I made a point on this program and some of my other programs, and you were with me when I said... Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid will cost Philadelphia more than help them. Embiid, because he's not on the floor consistency, dealing with a lot of injuries, and also Ben Simmons not having a jump shot, big problem. Yeah, it's a big problem. We've seen uh, Philadelphia have issues, although their past two seasons they have been able to make it to the second round. Last year, they're the only team in the league that could say they took the world champion Toronto Raptors to seven games Mm -hmm. in the playoffs. So there are positives. There are negatives. A lot of negatives indeed. Uh, But think about some of the positives. They destroyed the Milwaukee Bucks on Christmas Day. And then they go and lose three games in a row, Brian. So it's a a really (laughs) strange team. Uh, And, you know, I, I wish I could sit down with Jimmy Butler and ask him, Jimmy, why? Why didn't you stay? Because it looked like you guys... We're on the verge of building something special. As I mentioned, you took the Raptors 
to seven games. Kawhi is no longer in the Eastern Conference. Looked like a golden opportunity for the Philadelphia 76ers to become kings of the East. And so it always makes you wonder when you, you question Jimmy Butler's decision this past offseason about not remaining in Philadelphia. Was it that Philadelphia didn't want him or he didn't want them? I always wanted to know the answer to that question. I don't think any of us have gotten a real answer to that. Uh, but that answer may give us a bit of a an answer as to why Philadelphia continues to struggle and continues to be this this cloak and dagger team that we see. And they don't have that closer. Jimmy Butler was that closer. I'm inclined to think that uh, what a couple of people told me is that the culture in Philadelphia is one that Butler did not want to be a part of. And I'm really starting to believe that now because, as you said, they destroyed the Bucks on Christmas Day. Then they went out and, lo- and, and lost three in a row, and they didn't even look competitive in those games. Well, you know, Brian, in this, this past offseason, uh, in addition to not signing Jimmy Butler, they invested $340 million into Ben Simmons and Tobias Harris. Mm-hmm. Both of those guys have five-year, $170 million deals that were given to them this past offseason by the Sixers. I think they may have actually extended Simmons before last year's regular season ended. Either way, it's $340 million invested into two players. They obviously think Tobias Harris can be that closer. He's getting paid like he is. They invested in him like he's going to be. It's going to be up to Tobias Harris to deliver in closing times. We'll have to see if he can. Let's stay in the Eastern Conference. You mentioned this team already on a historic run. That's the Milwaukee Bucks looking to become the third team to win 70 games this year. Giannis is playing out of sight. Do you see anything missing that could propel the Milwaukee Bucks past the Eastern Conference Finals this spring? Well, you know, when it comes playoff time, I often wonder how the Bucks are going to get the job done against the big boys in seven-game uh, series where they're going to need a good production from that point guard position. And I don't think they always get it, but for somehow, some way, the Bucks and i got to give credit to Coach Budenholzer because he's one of the best basketball minds I think there is in basketball. You know, just about every night I turn around, Brian, and the Bucks are beating somebody by 20 points. You know, they're probably favored by 10 or 12 in most of these games, and they're beating people by 20 points on a consistent basis. So I have to look at Budenholzer's system, but I think he may have found something. I think he may not, not need that stud of a point guard that uh, Westbrook or Damian Lillard or Chris J- James Harden, Steph Curry, he may go with a two-headed monster of George Hill and Eric Bledsoe. And the way it's worked so far the first half of the season, who can argue with them? So I'm going to stop being so concerned about the lack of a talented superstar point guard on that Milwaukee Bucks team, and I'm just going to sit back and continue to admire what they do have and probably try to have to accept the fact that this team is for real, although they're still not my pick to win the Eastern Conference title. Not mine either, which leads me to this point of our discussion, and I've asked this question before uh, to you on Snowman of the Morning as well as off the air. Why do people still doubt the defending world champion Toronto Raptors? I think it's a talent reason, Brian. I mean, they're sitting at 28-14 and in the standings. They're one game behind Miami for the second spot in the Eastern Conference, which is exactly where they finished the season last year Mm -hmm. with Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green on their roster. They finished number two in the regular season. So it's an impressive job by Nick Nurse. And uh, I think the reason that I don't take them as seriously as maybe I should, maybe I'm wrong for this, but I look at the players on their team and I just don't think that they have the talent when it comes playoff time. But like I said, a lot of us may turn out to be wrong. Yeah, I know I was wrong uh, last year when the Raptors got to the World Championship Series and beat Golden State in six games, including winning three on the road in Oakland. So they just may be waiting for they they just may be waiting for playoff time to you know really really turn it on. How about the Boston Celtics? What's your view of them right now as we are into the first month of the new year? Well, you know, the Celtics had a a good streak going up until about two weeks ago, and it seems like lately every time I turn around, 
they're getting beat by inferior opponents. Just a couple of nights ago, it was the Phoenix Suns. Uh, a few nights before that, it was the San Antonio Spurs and another team that shouldn't have beat them, beat them of the day. I forget the team, but they're, they're not playing exactly good basketball right now. That being said, the Celtics are still, I uh, just, uh, like one or two games behind Miami. They're right there in the second or third seed, but they need to play a little bit better than what I've seen them play lately. I hear a lot of trade talk conversation going on, which could include Andre Drummond ending up in Boston in a three team deal that would send Gordon Hayward to the Dallas Mavericks and uh, Tim Hardaway over to Detroit. In a lot of ways, that makes sense for all three of those teams. So let's keep an eye on Danny Ainge. We know he likes to make moves. We know he's usually a pretty good uh, uh, move maker when it comes to making moves. So let's see if the Celtics go after some in- interior help. I can't imagine that they're just going to ride with Enos Cantor and Robert Tice as their main guys in the middle. So let's see what happens with Danny Ainge in that front office in Boston, Brian. Surprise team in the Eastern Conference that could sneak into the playoffs. Ooh, okay, well, let me give you two surprise teams, but these are already teams – my two big surprise teams in the East, uh, but they're already in the playoffs, so they're, they're, it's not going to answer your question. Uh, but I will get to you. I will address your question after I tell you. To me, the two most surprising are ones that we just talked about, the defending world champion Toronto Raptors. Nobody saw them at 28 and 40, and 28 and 14, 42 games into the season, including myself. And then also the Indiana Pacers, winners of five straight, set to get Victor Oladipo back in about two weeks. Keep an eye on them. I love them more and more by the day, Brian. Malcolm Brogdon, Victor Oladipo, DeMontis Sabonis, Miles Turner. Those boys can play some ball in Indiana. Let's keep an eye on them. But in terms of surprise teams, I'm going to go with my Orlando Magic. I And I say my Orlando Magic because I cover them. I live here in Central yeah. Florida. Yeah. And I think they're playing I think they're playing better than, than uh, I anticipated them playing, especially losing Jonathan Isaac about – Two or three weeks ago, Isaac goes down, and you really thought the bottom would fall out. Instead, they're winning games on the L.A. Lakers' home court while Markel Fultz is having a triple-double. I like what's going on in Orlando. I'll sing sing the praises of this team, again, aside of Orlando, a team that I really believe, and I still believe, that can make one big push and get in to the postseason, although it'll be at a, a very, very low seed. You got to take a look at the young Chicago Bulls. And and I've heard you mention this many times throughout the season, Brian. I've got to ask you, let's take a look at this team because I want to know exactly what the snowman is seeing because I don't always get to see all the games and there may be something I'm missing. I know Levine playing pretty good at point guard. I'd like to see him play a little more consistent, Brian. Sometimes he's scoring 49 points and sometimes he's scoring 13. I'd like to see a little more consistency. I think marketing in, the, in his third year is starting to blossom into a pretty good player. Uh, certainly not a all-star, but he's getting there and he's getting better by the year, so I like that. Mm-hmm. Kobe White, we've seen some erratic shooting from him, but I love the way he shoots the three-pointer. But tell us a little bit more about the personnel on the Chicago Bulls that, think, that makes you think that they could make a playoff push. You just mentioned him, Kobe White. Need some more minutes. You mentioned his erratic shooting. Yes, he has been erratic, but he's had games where he's knocked down five, six, and seven three-point shots, and sometimes that comes within a half. He did that in a half a couple of times this year. I really believe that their rookie, Kobe White, is going to be a key in stabilizing this Bulls team and directing this Bulls team. I love what Zach Levine has done, but inconsistent scoring, especially lately. Kobe White, I really believe, is going to be that key. Mm-hmm. And they made a deal with Washington. They requ- acquired Otto Porter Jr. Uh, they're paying him a huge amount of money, Brian. Mm-hmm. Has he been what you've expected in Chicago? And what is his situation as far as injuries? Has he been out of the lineup? And do you expect to see him back in? And, and can we get some consistency for him from a guy who's making $25 million bucks a year? I'm hoping he gets back in the lineup after the All-Star break. And you mentioned the big word, consistency. That is such a key, especially with the Bulls being in the position that they're in. They've knocked off a couple of high-profile teams, including the Boston Celtics. I think that was the team you were trying to mention. They beat them at home. 
uh, in the United Center. But, you yep. know, the Bulls need to get more consistency. They can put up 120 points at any time, but unfortunately they can only they can always be held to under 80 at any time also. We've seen both sides of the spectrum this year. But at the same time, it, it's going to be a stabilizing factor of Kobe White, Laurie Markkinen, um, Zach Levine, to really get really get this team going and they also have to hit the boards more consistently well you know the good news for the bulls uh, brian is i think that eighth spot is going to open up i think teams one through six are pretty much set in stone it's just a matter of where they're going to finish at the end of the season i think orlando is going to find a way to keep that seventh spot but the bottom may fall out in brooklyn we've seen what's going on with kyrie irving we've heard his recent comments uh, he may be ready to take a, a gas can and a lighter and just blow that whole thing up in Brooklyn, similar to what he did in Boston last year. Uh, if that happens, that's going to leave the number eight spot open for somebody to grab. And it's either going to be a team like Chicago. Uh, I, I could imagine Atlanta or any of these other teams. So really it's a golden opportunity. Uh, Charlotte's also playing pretty well this year. I got to say that hardly any talent on that team yet. James Borrego has that team playing tough just about every night. Another uh, leaf off the uh, Popovich coaching tree. I mean, we're seeing yep. it all over the place with Budenholzer, uh, James Borrego, and there was another one on my mind just a moment ago that I just escaped my name. So uh, let's keep an eye on that. And luckily for the Bulls, that eighth spot might come open because the, the, new, the Brooklyn Nets may implode from within. And they, they've they imploded from within from the start of the season. And I want you to answer this question honestly. Have you noticed that when Kyrie Irving is not on the floor, the team seemed to do better? That was proven in Boston with their run to the East Finals two years ago. So now he moves to Brooklyn. You would think when opening with a 50-point night, you know, that it would spark him and his team to really be a competitor. Unfortunately, that just hasn't been the case. The Nets have been better without him than with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and obviously Boston uh, is much better without him as well. Um, you know, the, one of the things that bothered me last year, Brian, as, a, as a, somebody who likes the Celtics, and I was wondering why didn't Danny Ainge make a deal and get something for Kyrie Irving before the trade deadline. Number one, he would have been able to get something for him. And number two, it would have improved their chances at advancing in the playoffs by not having him. Mm-hmm. So right now, uh, that's all Brooklyn's problem. They decided to give him the huge contract, and they're going to have to live with the consequences. Uh, he's under contract for the next four years. I can't imagine any other team would ever want to take uh, him off Brooklyn's hands. So it's their problem, and they're going to have to live with it. But, yeah, his attitude seems to be – just a terrible attitude for somebody who's ever really accomplished anything on his own. Uh, so we'll have to see how it plays out throughout the rest of the season. It is a horrible attitude to have. Let's move on to the Western Conference. And uh, who's the biggest disappointment you think so far in the Western Conference? Biggest disappointment I'd see. I would have to say Sacramento uh, is a disappointment. This is a team that was getting close to making the playoffs last year. And you thought that this might be the year that they would jump into the race. And they're really not even that close. You know, there's a log jam after the eighth spot for, from, for spots nine through 13 or 14. Uh, so Sacramento is certainly a disappointment. Um, other than that, I think everybody else is pretty much playing some good basketball. I can't think of any other that comes to mind. San Antonio uh, being able to even stay close in the playoff race. I can't call that a disappointment when you look at their personnel. They're simply not as talented as a lot of the other, the top six teams. I mean, I look at the Western Conference like this, Brian. We've got the two teams in LA. Those are probably one and two. Then you've got the two mountain time teams. And these are the mystery teams, in my opinion, Brian, because they're good and they're getting better. And we don't know how much better they're going to be by the time we get to the playoffs. Number one, you've got the Denver Nuggets with Michael Porter Jr., who is playing really good basketball. And if they get consistent production from that guy, Look out. They're as good as anybody when that's happening. And then the Utah Jazz are assimilating Mike Conley into their lineup. So they've got another half of the season to work Conley into the lineup. We've seen what the Jazz have done pretty much without Conley for the first half of this season. Imagine a healthy Mike Conley playing all-star basketball running that team. They're going to be scary. 
So the, the two Mountain Time teams look out because we don't know how good they could be by the time we get to April. And then you've got the two Texas teams. You've got Houston, who one day plays like they're a top four team, and then the next night they'll play like they don't even belong in the playoffs. <laughs> I don't trust them. I know, I know you don't either. I and sure then you've got the young up, upstart Dallas Mavericks, and if they can make a move and acquire a guy like Gordon Hayward or Goran Dragic to add to Porzingis and Luka, and the key thing is Porzingis' health, uh, they may make some noise when they make it to the playoffs as well. Chris Pirtle, NBA Insider, joining me here. Um, one team that made the playoffs last year that has been a terrible disappointment, but they still stand only three games out of the number eight spot. That's the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah, well, that's a team. When you asked me about disappointments, I forgot about them, to tell you the truth. So that should have been right there at the top of my list with the Sacramento Kings. I mean, they made the Western Conference Finals last year. Uh, they go out and they acquire some decent talent like Whiteside, who for fantasy basketball players, puts up some good numbers, uh, but just doesn't seem to play good team basketball, whether he's in Miami or whether he's in Portland. And then they go out and obviously acquire Car Carmelo Anthony, who turns out to play some really good and efficient basketball for them. You would think they would be in a better spot than yeah. they are, but I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this, Brian, they've got the talent as long as McCullough's injury from the other day isn't that significant. I wouldn't just, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see the Blazers get it together this second half of the season and squeak into the playoffs in each of the last two seasons, the Blazers have finished number three in the Western conference. And if you can finish third seed back to back years in the Western conference, that means you're a pretty damn good basketball team and you've got a pretty good coach. The Blazers fit the bill on both of those. I expect them this second half of the season to get it together and find their way into the playoffs. Now let me give you two surprises, Brian, Two real quick surprises I've got to give you in the Western Conference. Who in the heck saw the Oklahoma City Thunder where they are right now? They're only a game or two off the pace they were at this same time last year when they had Russell Westbrook and Paul George, which is totally incredible. They sit in the number seven seat. And then the Memphis Grizzlies. Yes. These guys, these guys weren't supposed to be talking playoffs. I mean, they were supposed to be talking draft lottery again to help John Morant. So Oklahoma City and Memphis, to me, are two of the biggest surprises in the entire NBA. I had both of those teams down there at the bottom with Golden State in the Western Conference race, and two of them now are contending for the playoff race. Speaking of the Golden State Warriors, they have fallen on some very, very hard times this year with all of the injuries they've had to combat, losing Klay Thompson in the finals, uh, losing Steph Curry early on in the year. They sit in last place in the Western Conference. But if you look at the way that they play and how they're acting, they're not acting like the last place team in the Western Conference. They're like, you know what, we're just going to shape all this up play the way that we can, given the limited personnel that we can, and then after we do our draft during the summer, insert some pieces in place, then we get Clay and Steph back, and then we'll we'll be fine. Well, you know, Brian, the past in Golden State is bright, and I think the future in Golden State is bright also, because you're right, they play some tough basketball, they've got a really good coach, as we know, who's going to not make his first appearance to the finals this year, and I don't think that's something he wants to get used to. I think the Warriors' future, like I said, is bright because if they end up getting the number one or number two pick and you package that up with D'Angelo Russell, there are teams out there with guys like Carl Anthony Towns. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine Carl Anthony Towns going to the Golden State Warriors, joining Steph, Clay, and Dre? I mean, Towns can shoot the three-pointer, a big man that can shoot. He would be a younger and more talented version of DeMarcus Cousins. So uh, I think, again, the future is bright in Golden State. It really is. Chris Pirtle joining me here for our NBA conversation. Tell everybody where they can find you. Sure, you can follow us on Sports Junkies BB, or you can look me up on Facebook, Chris Pirtle, P-I-R-T-L-E. I'm the one down in beautiful Vero Beach, Florida, where the temperature today is around 73 and sunny. And I know it's just about freezing cold everywhere else in the country, so I just wanted to (laughs) give everybody a weather update. Oh, man. Chris Pirtle joining me to talk some NBA. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate the time. You got it, Brian. And I saw you doing some play-by-play the other day on the basketball games. Mm -hmm. Keep it up, man. You've got a great voice. You're an excellent talent, and it's always a pleasure to talk to you. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. You got it. Take care.
Hey boys and girls, I have a question for you. What are you doing listening to the talking heads? Turn on Snowman in the morning for real sports talk. He has the hot takes that will make you melt. Thanks a lot, Doc. Welcome back to Snowman in the morning. We are happy to have you with us. Hey, don't forget to check out our social media. The ID you need is SITM, the number 9, T-O-N-O-O-N. That's SITM, 9 to noon. Now, I want to welcome someone that I became fast friends with because of our love for baseball. And he is involved with someone in uh, my old territory, the uh, Mishawaka Brewers. We're going to talk about that as well as all the cheating scandals in baseball that's going on right now and the trouble with baseball attendance. This is C.J. Swartz, and he joins me right now. How are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty good, Brian. How you doing? I'm doing good. One of the first things I found about you and loved about you is we share the same favorite team. Uh, sh- the Chicago White Sox. Oh, yeah. And we also share a favorite slugger, that, of course, being the Big Hurt Hall of Famer Frank Thomas. All-time all time favorite player right there. Grew up looking up to him, man. So let's start with the White Sox. They've made some, they made some good moves this offseason, but the problem that I see, they still don't have enough arms. Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm thinking, too, with the White Sox. I've been, a, for the last few years, I've been pretty upset with how things have uh, gone over and just, I haven't been too happy with the rebuild. I'm, I'm happy now with some of the, how our guys are progressing. And it's, for the most part, it seems like they've been working out, but the White Sox had a, a tough history of uh, developing prospects. So it's been something I've always I've been monitoring the last few years. And I feel like we have finally been able to develop our own prospects, even though some of these guys we got from it via trade or free agency. But I feel like we are finally at the point where we are developing our talent and all on the same page within the organization. It has taken a long time to get back to that point. Now, go back to one of the key points of baseball. The Washington Nationals proved it. You have to have pitching. How big is the pitching going to be for the White Sox this year? And is it enough for them to compete in that division? I think right now with our pitching staff, I think we have a good mix of young and old guys. I like what the Nationals did. What they did, they had a lot of strong arms, but they were veterans. I think that's signing Dallas Keuchel, signing Gio Gonzalez. Those are two guys, World Series winners, and a Cy Young Award winner out of one of those, too. So really come in and really teach some of our younger pitchers, guys like Michael Kopech, Dylan Seed, and even Lucas Giolito. Those guys that can now learn from a guy who's been there, done that, and pitch on the biggest stage in in baseball. Yeah, absolutely right, because with the signing of Keiko and uh, the return of Gio Gonzalez, who started his career with the White Sox, you know, to have Keiko being that, that, that veteran presence kind of brings back the Mark Burley feeling, doesn't it? Oh, uh, Mark Burley, he was one of my favorites as well. It definitely does, especially Keiko, the signing of Dallas Keiko. He's just a methodical pitcher, like to paint the corners, get that off-speed work into his favor. And almost pitch backward to use his fastball as like a changeup, kind of quick pitch to the hitters. How big was it for the White Sox to not only sign Jose Abreu but extend him? Signing Jose Abreu and extending him is my favorite piece this offseason. This offseason would have been almost a waste in my eyes if we didn't bring back that leadership. He's been with us since 2012, and all White Sox fans know it's been a long time since we've had a winning record since 2008 and just a guy that has been there through all this time put the time in he's become a leader especially with our cuban uh players we have a lot of guys that have defected from cuba and just being a guy that can take these young guys under his wing and show them the right way to do things show them how to work in the off season show them what to do on their days off what to do leading up to the game i think that is going to be the biggest piece for the White Sox, just bringing him back and having that veteran leadership from within, some guys that went through all those struggles with the White Sox. 
Yasmani Grandal, big signing by the White Sox. What's your take on his signing? You know, watching him two years ago uh, in the NLCS against the Brewers, he really did not do a good job. And then he did a kind of a poor job in the playoffs as well with, I mean, in the World Series with the Dodgers. But after resetting, getting with a new team last year, playing for a contract, you, he really showed his tools last year. And I think that is going to be able to translate over. And he was one of the big reasons Dallas Keuchel signed with us because we had that veteran presence behind the plate. He's going to be able to take these young guys just like Keiko and show them what to do, yeah, show them how to warm up, how to be a veteran, how to be a major league baseball player. And all and that. And his bat, is, his bat too. Yeah. We haven't had a, uh, any pop out of the catcher spot since AJ Pierzynski left. Oh. So it's going to be nice to get some production. A legend, AJ Pierzynski. Who 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 can I forget AJ's eight years with the White Sox? CJ Swartz joining me to talk some baseball, and we got to get to it. The cheating scandal that ro- that has rocked baseball yet again, aside of the strike of 94, the steroid era, you got this going on. I, the sign stealing is one thing. Using technology, really? Exactly. See, I play on a semi-pro team. I played baseball. I never, got, never played any professionally. But all my coaches growing up taught me, if I'm on second base, Watch, watch the catcher. See what you can pick up. Pick up the signs. Relay them to your hitter. But that's the far as the extent it went. Other than maybe a coach looking mm-hmm. down and seeing the signs hanging under the catcher putting them down too low. Yeah. But man, using using technology the way they did, I got no problem if they're banging on trash cans if they pick the signs up some some way somehow. Right. That's just the same as a coach going, "Hey, what do you say two four or what do you say, CJ?" determining whether it be off speed or fastball man using technology that is the lowest low i've ever heard of in the game of baseball outside of the 1919 world series throwing i can't believe you know and i followed the astros for a couple of years because of the way they came up and suddenly went from a bottom dweller to a playoff team to a world series champion and i and i like that story but now to find out this behind it if I were a baseball fan, I would be so angry right now with the Houston Astros, with Alex Cora and Carlos Beltran for being involved in this in, in this mess, and that's about the best way that I can put it. Yeah, I mean, as a as a baseball fan, this really sucks to know that the players they came from a former player in Carlos Beltran and Alex Cora, who played in AJ. All three of these guys are former major league players, so it's not like there was just some analytical guy that was trying to get the edge. These are major leaguers that were out there competing, too. It, it really sucks to see that their thirst for winning went, took it that far, took it to this extreme elaborate scheme, and then to even possibly go even farther with what they are being alleged to do with putting buzzers on. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much that is true or not. Uh, but then the players' reactions, I don't know if, if everyone saw this, but it was the Houston Nationals player convention this weekend, and most of their big names were not there, for probably for good reason. But Alex Bregman and Jose Altuve were both there, and both Alex Bregman's comments, man, make me just think he is completely guilty of everything he did. He had no defense for himself. He's just saying, re, saying a rehearsed line. It went something like, the commissioner made his report, MLB did their report, and the Astros did what they did. And I have no further comment. That's just weak right there to me. It is. It, it is because if that were me and I was accused of cheating in baseball or any sport and I know I am innocent of said charge, I'm vehemently denying it, not just to my teammates, but to my fans. So Alex Bregman, I believe, is completely dirty. I think so, too. And it, it, it sucks to see because he was a big He's a big name in the game right now. He's huge. All the all the kids love him, and he's got a huge social media presence as well. He's done his own thing, and to see what he's done at this age, I know the white. He was a big piece. The White Sox wanted to get him back in the uh, when they were trying to get rid of Quintana. Yeah, I don't know how good of a player. Now I always wondered how how he would have looked in a White Sox uniform, but now I question: what he, Is he really this good? Yeah, yeah, you got to question that now. Him, Altuve. Anybody else who was involved in this, which brings me to my next question, talking with C.J. Swartz of the Mishawaka Brewers, 
do you suspend the players? You know, that's a, that's a tough one. I think um, if you suspend the players, you have to suspend every single player yeah. that was on that team that year because they knew. Everyone knew. You can't just be in the dugout down the down at the end of the dugout and like your guys banging on a trash can all season and not know what's up. So I don't think you can really suspend all the players unless you want to suspend the entire Astros and whoever was on that team, whatever team they're on now. That would be kind of harsh and really wouldn't work. Doesn't make sense. But if players were, if players had a buzzer on them, I adamantly believe it's a lifetime ban. That yeah. is no yeah. different. That is cheating. Just like 1919, they were cheating to lose Pete Rose, cheating, cheating and gambling. That's a whole nother story. But cheating to actually win and know and put some, put something on your body. That's just way too far in my eyes, and I think that's that's a lifetime ban. You're out of the game, man. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely wrong, and I hate cheaters in baseball. I've said that on this program so many times. C.J. Swartz joining me, talking cheating scandal, talking baseball. Now, is the punishment that the Astros got enough? Is there something more that Major League Baseball could have done to enforce a message that no cheating would be allowed in any sort. My my original thought on this um, was that they did not get a harsh enough penalty in my eyes. What I had my what I came up with was the Astros ascended to the top by cheating, and so they took a year away from pos- from m- many players in the organization in an organization like the Dodgers. It mm-hmm. basically took a, a year away from them. So I think a stiff penalty of your entire 20 next draft is nullified. You cannot draft in the next draft. You can sign the undrafted free agents, so the guys that are left over that didn't get picked up that would have with your 30 or 40 picks. You can go out and sign guys, so it, it takes your franchise back an entire year. And you have to go forward from there. And I think no team would want to take an entire year back yeah. just for that World Series. Yeah, you absolutely. You take an entire year back, you're, you're resetting everything. It is a full it, it is a full reset. A.J. Hinch fired. Luno fired. Who would who would manage – who's going to manage the Astros now? Who's going to be their GM now? And would you want to step into this messy situation? That's a that's a great question right there, Brian. Um, I see that they have they've had interviewed uh, Buck Showalter, Dusty Baker, a couple other guys, and if I'm those guys, those are prominent names in managerial history. They've won World Series before. At least uh, I know Dusty Baker. I'm not 100 percent on Buck Showalter or not, but I think he has. Um, but I wouldn't want to put my name in on that if I'm a if I, I'm a longtime manager. I wouldn't want to put my name on, on that and just the accusations that would be coming up, coming out of it. Now, if I'm a first time manager, like I get thrust into this role, I would probably take it because if you take this team now and win a World Series, it almost it looks good on you now because you did it legitimately, right? And they know no cheating. So, if you're a new manager, I say go for it. But if you've managed already. There's no reason to get to put your name in on this. One final question. Do you strip the World Series championship from the Astros? No, I don't think so. Because in the playoffs, I don't know how much they were were able to do the whole cheating thing in 2017. 2019, different story if they were using buzzers. 2017, they still played the game. They still had to play on the road. And they still did have to win in Game 7 in on the road so i don't think you can take that away from them but i see the legitimate gripe of why you could plus it's, it's never been done in baseball you it's, it's this is an ncaa where you can go back and like strip something away from them i don't think you can no yeah it's kind of a tough call i don't think you can either before we get out of here tell me about the mishawaka brewers man all right mishawaka brewers this is a this will be our 16th year in existence. We are a 
semi-pro team under the NABF, the National Amateur Baseball Federation. I believe that's been around since 1914. So this will be the 106th year of the NABF. And like I said, it's our 16th year. And our manager, uh, CEO, operator, uh, Sean Harper, is a guy who started this back in the day in a different league and then moved it into the Woodbat NABF League. And we are a group of individuals. Uh, we have guys from college, D1 to NAIA. Um, we had almost all three, all four levels last year and guys that play independent ball that want to play to play if they get released or are in between teams. And our goal is to reach the NABF World Series in Battle Creek, Michigan and be the first team in the South Bend history ever to uh, earn a bid there. Wow. We're gonna have to keep up and see if they can gonna have to keep up and see if they can do it. You can follow us on arenasportsnet.com and we'll keep you we'll keep you updated on the Mission Walker Brewers. CJ Swartz joining me to talk some baseball. Thanks a lot for coming on. I truly appreciate it. All right, thanks for having me, Brian. I got some more baseball notes for you. Snowman in the morning, back in a flash. This is Snowman in the Morning. I did not need to be told that. Where true sports talk lives. Excellent. Can't wait. And I have someone very special waiting on the hotline. And he does the same thing that uh, that I do. Motivates people to give their best. And plus, he shares a microphone with a lot of friends with sports in front of him. And he also has what's going to be one of my favorite books, and I can't wait to get a copy of it. And I'm going to have him talk about it, and I'm going to introduce him right now. This is Chris Williams, a.k.a. Uncle Smoothie, and he joins the snowman right now. How are you doing, buddy? What's happening, partner? I appreciate that intro, man. You sound make me sound really good. good you are really me. good. You are really good. Let's just I'm putting it out there. You are really good. Thanks for coming on. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. No, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Let's dive in. Please tell me about your book because I have been wanting to get you on the show to talk about this book for two reasons. One, I'm very interested, and two, inspiring men. Please talk about your book. No question. Well, Stoneman, first and foremost, the book is 20 Beautiful Men. It's a compilation book of 20 different stories of guys overcoming different obstacles, talking about their pain, sharing their emotions, things that men usually don't do. And I think it's a great book for almost anyone, specifically men, because like we talked about previously, you and I, sometimes men, we just don't share what we go through. And when we don't share it, we keep that energy in and it turns oftentimes into bad energy. But a lot of these guys have overcome so many different things. And if it's not one story that you can relate to, there are 20 different stories. So you have to be able to relate to at least one. My story is the last story, the way that's worked out. I wore number 20 when I played college basketball. I wanted to be the last story, 20 beautiful men. So it all kind of works out together. And I just love the premise of that book because many times on this show in six years, I have shared some personal things that I have gone through off the air, including depression, including losing my daughter. And you said something that's very important, very important. And uh, my wife and I talk about it all the time. Men have been conditioned by society to keep their feelings inside. You're not supposed to show any kind of emotion. I've been told many times before, you're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to show any kind of anger because If you show anger, especially being a black man, that's a black mark against you anyway. And society has, you know, conditioned us, you know, we to show that kind of anger anyway. So they can point to us and say, see, you see that right there. That is what you're looking forward to. If you have them in your company, if you have them broadcasting your games, if you have them doing anything like that, what people don't realize is that because men have been conditioned to keep their emotions inside, they could pop out or pop off at any given time. And it's not just over one incident either. 
Well, Snowman, you make an excellent point because oftentimes as men, our default emotion is anger because we don't share a lot of the other emotions so well, caring, sad, things that we would come across as, no, you shouldn't use that emotion. So you depress that, you suppress that emotion, and it comes out as anger. I always share this story as a speaker. From the age of 15 to about 35, I would not allow myself to cry. Now, I could be sad, I could be hurt, but I would turn the sadness into anger, the hurt into anger. So you wouldn't see me cry. I would get angry before I would cry, but I came to the conclusion, you just thank God that you come to some maturity where you understand or I need to use these emotions. They're important. And you brought up your beautiful wife. I have a beautiful wife. And if you want to be able to work with your wife, your spouse, or your significant other, you have to be able to tap in to all of your emotions. And this book allows you to see how different guys have overcome obstacles to be better in using their emotions to be more important, more special, and be the best they could be. And it's not about being a sap. It's not about being soft. It's not about anything like that. It's about for once and for here on out, from, from here on out, men being not only told to use their emotions, but allowed to use their Correct. emotions. Correct. And you need more people like you and myself to make it clear that it's not a bad thing. And I love the title, 20 Beautiful Men. Beautiful men. You can be beautiful as a man. Yes, you can. And when I sign my books, I always say, embrace your beauty. It's the truth. It's the absolute truth. It's something my wife coaches me about all the time because when I met her, I was going through a horrible, horrible depression. There was so much stuff going Mm -hmm. on. And we sat and talked, and she knew something was, was boiling inside of me, and it didn't want to come out as anger. She just sat me down one day and said, let it out. Tell me what's going on. And I told her everything, you know, like I said, losing my daughter, uh, losing my dad. And just recently she got in my head about you never gave yourself time to grieve the two biggest losses in your life. You just pushed it down and kept going. And she's been nothing but right, because now that I um, I've, I've sought counseling. I've talked to my wife, and yes, I do take a depression medicine. It's helped, and it's really helped me to see I haven't grieved for a lot of things, but the two biggest, losing my dad in 2007, eight years later, losing my daughter. Snowman, I do some coaching, and that's an area I work with guys all the time about mourning. We definitely do not take that seriously. The approach to mourning is, is let it go, be strong, be tough. That is a tough issue. It you is. have to give yourself ample time to mourn over something. You've lost a huge piece most of the time in your life, so you have to give it some time. Again, I do some speaking. You're aware of that. I'm a positive energy coach. Yes, sir. And again, part of being positive is understanding there are going to be setbacks. Everything's not going to be good all the time, but finding out where you can fit in and get the good out of something. You can't just pass everything along. You have to be able to mourn over different situations. And you talk about death. That's a huge obstacle that a lot of guys don't take seriously, just people in general. It's, you have to be able to mourn. It's so true that they don't mourn death and don't do it correctly. I sh- <laughs> I certainly haven't done it correctly, you know, and uh, both of my grandparents lost them in a span of two years, as mentioned lost my dad, lost my daughter, and another D word that a lot of men go through that is starting to come out now, depression. Snowman has been around for years, but we just haven't approached it, and you're correct. And you've been very fortunate to have your beautiful wife to come to you and sit you down and explain and assist and help. Everybody doesn't have that. Everyone doesn't have it, and you have to just be careful. And that's part of my positive energy tour, understanding that so many people are fragile. And I just go over different things on just saying things that can be nice, sincere, can assist and help somebody take the right path opposed to the wrong path. I talk about being able to smile. Two most important words in the English language are thank you, which lead to appreciation, which leads to validation. And the most important one, Snowman, hope. 
Yes. When you have hope, you get away from that depression. All we all need is hope, something you can. But when someone loses hope, they could care less about themselves. And of course, they don't care about anyone else. It is so true. So many things emotionally that uh, my wife and I have gone through in different parts of our lives. And we've been able to come together and talk about it a lot. And we basically talk about it on a daily basis and and say, how are we going to take this and turn it into positive energy? I got the positive energy coach in Chris Williams on the hotline with me here on this edition of Snowman in the Morning talking about his book, 20 Beautiful Men. What gave you the message that you write in your book when you sign your book to embrace your beauty? Because oftentimes people don't understand they are beautiful. And everyone has a certain amount of beauty that may, most people may not see, but you have to embrace what belongs to you. If you're a speaker like yourself or good on it, embrace it. Someone may not notice it, but you have to be able to embrace what you bring to the table. Everybody has some sort of beauty within. Embrace what is yours. Love it. Cherish it. And it's just a play on words because a lot of times men, you never hear say beauty. I'm a beautiful person. But yes, we all are beautiful. So I'm telling you to embrace that beauty. And you know what I love most about this book, Snowman? When you get yours, you'll see it. There's a yellow sticker right on the front. You know what that yellow sticker says? It says? Bestseller. How many bestsellers do you know? <laughs> uh, I know one now, and I got him on the phone with me. I absolutely you got love it. it. If I was close to you right now, I would shake your hand and say, nice to meet you, Uncle Smoothie, best-selling author. I'm That's proud wonderful. of that because an obstacle I overcame was, as a young man, wasn't a big reader. Didn't even really like reading that much. But I understand to be successful, to be where I need to go, you have to read. You have to write. Mm-hmm. And you have never known years ago Chris Williams, Uncle Smoothie. And I'm back. Man, one of my favorite play-by-play announcers of all time, the late, great Keith Jackson, who was the voice yes. of ABC Sports for many, many years, said something during a baseball broadcast, because a lot of people don't remember, he did baseball for a long time for ABC, mm-hmm. and he okay. did some reunion games for ESPN. One thing Keith Jackson said, before you talk in sports casting. You have to learn how to write. And one of they the work together. Yep, one of the one of the courses I'm so glad I took was sports writing. A lot of this I I am proud to say I've learned on the fly from from reading a lot of sports columns, a lot of sports articles, how to do uh, wrap ups from games and things like that, descriptive words to use. And being from being from Chicago, I listened to a lot of Bulls games when I was growing up. And that gave me the bug to be a sportscaster because my favorite voice of all time was Jim Durham, the longtime voice of the Bulls. Great Great voice. Great voice. Now, check this out. Born and raised in Philadelphia, my favorite voice, Sixer fan for me, the Zink. Dave Zinkoff. You got it, brother. (laughs) (laughs) Dave Zinkoff. Love it. Snowman. Give me a little zinc. I know you can do everybody <laughs> fairly well. Give me the doc. Everybody can do the doc on the zinc. Let's get it. And you're right, the Massachusetts number six, Julius <laughs> Irving. Uh, I love it. I love it. Well, check it out. That's a great segue into commentating. Most people, obviously, who do not know me, but most people who do know me, I do color commentary for ESPN. Mm-hmm. You and I, again, we are brothers in that area. Voice of the Jaspers. Actually, I did my first Jasper game. I had been out of town because I recently moved to Florida, but I'm back here in New York for a couple of days or so, broadcast some games. Did the game the other night, good win versus Siena, back on the air on Thursday versus Quinnipiac out of the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference, the MAC, the Division One basketball. Yes. So if anyone wants to listen to Uncle Smoothie, ESPN 3 on Thursday at 7 p.m. Is Knickerbocker Arena still alive? Because when yes, I sir, really got to see in the Saints play. when I got into college basketball and started checking out the NCAA tournament, that was one of the arenas that was featured during what is now Championship Week. You know, always saw Knickerbocker, so right. always saw Knickerbocker Arena host a first or a, a, a second round game. And you mentioned the Manhattan Jaspers, man. It, it, so many years ago, I remember seeing the Manhattan Jaspers not only being ranked, but winning their conference and getting into the tournament. 
And what people don't understand when it comes to college basketball, when you are what would be classified as a mid-major and you get into, back then, the round of 64, that's a party waiting to happen. Never mind what happened in the tournament game. That's a party. No question. Now, Snowman, you may not realize it. In 1993, before I was Uncle Smoothie, I was just Smoothie then, Mm -hmm. I was the point guard on that team that went to the first NCAA tournament for Manhattan. I remember that team. was our first year to go to the tournament. We won the championship at Knickerbocker Arena. Mm-hmm. I make a free throw to win it to get us into the tournament. Yes. Winning free throw against Niagara. Niagara, absolutely. Look it up, Google it. Yep. Uncle Smoothie was doing his thing back then. Yes, indeed. I remember the a I, number 11 seed versus Virginia. Virginia. I remember I remember the 93 tournament. And like I said, if you're consi- if you're a team that no one gives a chance to make the tournament, it's a party waiting to happen. I went through it a couple no of years ago. I went through it a couple of years ago being from Chicago. My team, my beloved Northwestern Wildcats, finally made their Ooh, first appearance run. in the NCAA tournament. And you want to talk about an a celebration when they got their selection, got their seed and where they and where they were going and, and they showed Welsh Ryan Arena, a place I'm very, very familiar with. All you folks up in Evanston, in my in my hometown in the Chicagoland area, y'all know Welsh Ryan Arena. You want to talk about a full house and a party that happened? That day in 2017 was a day, as a Wildcats fan, I'll never forget. Well, I'll tell you about our selection Sunday. Like you said, probably one of the more exciting days of your life as a player because everybody has their attention on you. Being in New York, it's a little bit more energy, so it was so much fun. Mm-hmm. We had not been to the tournament in more than 30 years. So, again, in being the first, and I always tell everyone this, you may have a better team than my team in 1993, but you'll never see or say that you were the first. We are the True. first team in Manhattan College history go, to go to the NCAA tournament. 1993, one of my favorite years of watching the uh, NCAA basketball tournament. Chris Williams, Uncle Smoothie, joining me here on the program. And tell, take everybody through that day, the anticipation, the buildup, fans coming fans coming in. You're awaiting your assignment. Tell, Take everybody through that process. Well, for us, the great thing, Snowman, the MAC tournament was a little bit earlier than the other conference tournaments. So we got a chance to watch other teams battle and the more exciting part was anytime someone would win their tournament, since we had done already, they'll say, and this team joins Manhattan in the field of 64. <laughs> Everybody seems to be joining us. Yes. <laughs> and they would put our name up there. This team's in already. We were already in. So we went through a, maybe a week of that, which was so much excitement. <laughs> a lot of interviews. CBS, yes. ABC, mm-hmm. wasn't as much as it is now coming over to the school, interviewing us, being a senior. So I was always the spokesperson at this stage. So all that excitement. So leading up to the quote-unquote dinner, all the media attention, your family and friends are excited. You just want to know where you're going to go. You're hoping you can go somewhere far. We ended up (laughs) going to, uh, if I remember, the Carrier Dome. Yes. (laughs) We didn't go very far, but we wanted to go far, not understanding. If you're closer, you may have a better fan base. Yes. I always tell everyone the one thing I may regret just a tad is because we were so excited, we probably didn't as prepare as well as we should have right. to win a game versus a Virginia team that was beatable. But what we did do was we prepared the 95 team, mm-hmm. which received the at-large bid, the first time a team out of the MAC conference to ever get an at-large yep. from Manhattan College, and they won the first round. They beat Oklahoma. They did. They sure did. And 1995, I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, you know, covering the ACC tournament. So I had a chance to uh, see Dean Smith, uh, Dave Odom, and Wake Forest, and uh, all those teams. Coach Krzyzewski and the bunch at Duke. Nineteen man, 1995. Such memories with the NCAA Great tournament. Great years, man. Yep. Great years of basketball for me. Absolutely. The first year I started watching college basketball was 1982. And that's because oh, that's a, 
That's my man, Mr. Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> fell Mr. in love Miguel. with I fell in love with watching Patrick Ewing and the Georgetown Hoyas, and they right. eventually lost to a fellow who took over the NBA, and you know who I'm talking about, Michael Jordan and the North Carolina Tar Heels. Well, again, I affectionately call them Mr. Miguel if anybody didn't pick that up. I was referring to Michael Jordan. (laughs) Yes. But but, but you don't see games like that anymore where you see a full house at the Carrier Dome because Patrick Ewing's in town or full house at the Dean Smith Center because you're seeing North Carolina State and North Carolina. I miss the old Big East, man. St. John's, Georgetown, Connecticut. I miss that kind of Big East action. Well, you know what has happened, Snowman. The game has changed, and everyone knows that who's a basketball fan who works closely with it like us. But the one thing I've noticed the most is obviously you have a younger brand of basketball. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, a lot of the best players, they leave school early. Yes. So we don't get a chance to see them, quote unquote, at their peak. During that time period, you had a Ewing who was a four year senior. Yes. Derek Coleman. All these guys are men playing college basketball. Mm-hmm. So you know they were going to really get busy regardless of who they were playing against. So you're getting NBA level basketball at the college level during that time period. So now we get strictly good college basketball when we get, get good players. And if it's a good freshman or sophomore, we know they're leaving after one or two years. Remember the name Chris Mullen? And yes, how he, Mully the lefty. Yep, and how he used to terrorize the biggies for St. John's. Mm-hmm. He and Mark Jackson, I mentioned uh, Patrick Ewing, you mentioned Derek Coleman, um, per, Dwayne the Pearl Washington for Syracuse. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now check this out, Snowman. We talk about all these guys. And again, they all played four years, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. I'm in college myself watching these guys like they're pros. I can remember (laughs) being a freshman, sophomore, watching them like, wow, if we played them, this would be crazy. Yes, it would. We would make sure we sat down and watched them anytime Georgetown came on, anytime St. John's came on, or the Cuse. Again, I'm a player, a Division I player at Manhattan watching these guys like they're in a totally different league. Like they mm-hmm. don't even play college basketball. <laughs> that was the type of atmosphere that they created. Absolutely. And it's the kind of atmosphere that you want to create. One team that I loved watching in 1990, um, anybody remember? UNLV, Stacey? Please, you you, you, you know already LV. know where I'm going. <laughs> you already know where I'm going. Anybody remember Stacy Augman, Anderson Hunt, Larry Ooh, Johnson, and those boys? Man. Yes. <laughs> now check this out. Here's a great story for you, Snowman. Like I said, I was, I think, a freshman or a sophomore during that time mm-hmm. when that UNLV team was really so good. We would, after practice, again, we didn't have cable in the dorm. We only had cable in the locker room. Yes. We would go back to the locker room at night because those <laughs> games came on late. Yep, yep. Those were like games. UNLV. <laughs> yes, indeed. That's what we would do. We would go back to the locker room with snacks and the whole nine just to watch Greg Anthony, Stacey Allman, yep. Larry Johnson, all these guys <laughs> like, wow. Unbelievable. But again, the point I'm stressing is we were players ourselves. Yes. So we were excited about seeing them <laughs> i know i was oh, excited was I, I know i was excited seeing them play and remember folks when espn was in its heyday of covering college basketball they had a little something called big monday they had yes. they had a triple header they had games from the big east the big 10 and the big west and the big west is where unlv ruled and you the great word you used there was ruled Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nobody could touch those guys. And they had so much fun. Yes. So much fun. If I remember correctly, Larry Johnson's nickname, a lot of people didn't know, was the source. Yes. Because you could get everything you needed from Larry, and he was big on hugging everybody. Mm-hmm. After everything, he was smiling with that gold tooth. I love watching that guy UNLV. Uh Larry Johnson's one of my favorite one of my favorite players. I had when when I was a senior in high school. I was so enthralled with Larry Johnson and the Running Rebels. When we had a chance to make book covers for our books, I would make them with different with some of my different favorite players, like Larry wow. Johnson, like Michael Jordan, like Patrick Ewing, and the, rest of, and the rest of those guys. And my teachers would look at me and go, how did you create that? Like, I just drew it from memory. 
And you, when you have players like that, they are enthralled in your memory. And to tie it into everything that we've spoken about so far in this conversation, these were men that were having fun. These were men. Having these were fun. these were young yeah. men that were growing up with each other. This is when race didn't matter. This is where color didn't matter. This is when creed didn't matter. If you had a teammate, you were there for your teammate because that was your brother. Period. Take everything else out of the equation. You being a former student athlete, take everything else out of the equation. When you meet your teammate, those are your teammates. And that's one of the great things about sports, the brotherhood. Yes. What happens in the locker room is supposed to stay in the locker room. Again, I know so many players and teammates who have stories that should stay there. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, in this day and age, everything is shared. But during that time period, like you said, that brotherhood was much tighter and guys just really looked out for each other. Yeah, they did. They did. That's why it was so much fun back then to play the 80s and the 90s. That's why it was so much fun to play college basketball. I started covering it, like I said, in 1995, and you could see the camaraderie then, even when the 90s were coming to an end. Yes. Yes. Now, that's great stuff, no man. Great stuff. And and getting to the Final Four, oh, my goodness. I I can't even imagine the emotions being off the chart uh, you mentioned 1993. I can't imagine the emotions being off the chart for the Fab Five of Michigan, the Great Five of Dean Smith and North Carolina, getting to the Superdome in New Orleans, being in, on that kind of a stage. When it's just when men are on that kind of a stage, the emotions should come out. Period. Right. Right. Well, just remember Chris Weber calling that time out. Yeah. How emotional that was for him mm-hmm. and his teammates. So it's a lot that goes on, goes on, and it builds your character, you know, for after basketball. It does. When it's done correctly, when you have good coaches, you have good teammates, and all those things are things people oftentimes don't understand or notice. Because when I do my broadcast, I usually tell fans because they always – have something to say. We have to understand these are still young men. They're 17, 18, 19 years yeah. old. They may be very good basketball players, but they're still young kids. So and they're going to do and say some things that teenagers do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, they're, and they have to learn. They have to learn and they have to grow. And, and in today's society, they're forced to grow at a very rapid rate. But, but by, back rapid then, they were, yes. they were allowed to grow up with the time. That's what the that's what we need to allow these young student athletes to do to grow up with the time. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uncle Smoothie Chris Williams joining me here on the program. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media, my friend. They can find me on social media. Hear Chris P speak. I'm sorry. H e a r c h r i s s p e a k. Hear Chris speak on Instagram and Twitter, Facebook. Chris B. Period Williams on Facebook for the older group that likes to still use Facebook. That would be you and I, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, Uncle Smoothie, I really, really appreciate you coming on the program. I'm looking forward to reading your book, my friend. No question. Congratulations is in order. Thank you. You're doing a great job with the show. And if I believe I read you're going into some sort of syndication. You yeah. have a larger audience. Keep doing what you do, brother, and stay on the grind. I really appreciate thank I really appreciate that. Thank you, my friend. No problem at all. And tell the beautiful wife I said hello. And we'll shout do. out to my beautiful wife Leah too. <laughs> tell your beautiful wife I said hi, all right? You got it. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Hey, we got one more hour of this stuff. That comes your way next. Snowman of the morning, back in a flash. This is Snowman in the Morning, where true sports talk lives. I like him. He's silly. Cole Johnson, the host of On the Daily and Cole Sports and the VIP honors coming up very soon. But I I got a question and I I, I need to have a sneak peek at this. 
last time I ran, last Friday, I ran your premier bronze sexual confessions on Snowman mm-hmm. in the Morning, and the response was fabulous. It was absolutely fabulous. I really? sat here and laughed my head off when I listened to that segment. And everything you said in that was was true. You and I have discussed him on this program at nauseum. How about a sneak mm-hmm. peek in the next in, the, in how about a sneak peek to Wednesday? What you got up your sleeve? Okay. Well, what I'm going to talk about tomorrow because well, if for those who don't know and on the daily uh Every Wednesday, I do a segment where it's all LeBron, and I don't talk about LeBron James at any other juncture on my program the rest of the week. <laughs> it's only it's only Wednesday in mm-hmm. one segment. Mm-hmm. I just talk LeBron, LeBron, LeBron. So I'm, I'm going to mention the fact that he now is the number one merchandise seller. He's helped by the Lakers, of course, but he's the one uh, <laughs> merchandise seller in the league. Uh, he has the most votes for the uh, for for the All Stars uh, game. Mm-hmm. And more than likely, he's going to be the captain of one of the teams again. Uh, uh, he he got yeah again. Uh, he he got MVP chance when he was in Houston oh, this Lord. past weekend. Why? And yeah, and I had a conversation with a bronze sexual <laughs> where. <laughs> This is where it usually starts, and this is where I usually start laughing. <laughs> where we had this, we had this comparison of LeBron has never lost a first round series. Oh, Guys geez. that I know, like Jordan, well, he has lost his first first round series, or well, actually first three first round series. He only won one game in 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 those three. First first round series, nineteen eighty five, and he didn't win a he didn't win a first round series until Scottie Pippen joined the team, nineteen eighty eight, right, nineteen eighty eight. So I, I I heard that, you, and you heard that ridiculousness. I, I, yes, I heard that ridiculousness, and so I, I put it in this brass tacks. I said, okay, so if you had if you have a woman, and you get a chance to make love to her six times, and you make love to her all six times. That's ultimate success. Mm -hmm. But if you get a chance to make love to a woman nine times, but you only do it three, (laughs) you mean to tell me that you're going to award yourself because you had more chances? You had more chances to get the brass ring, but you failed six of those nine times versus you had six times to get the brass ring and you got it all six times? As a man, you would feel incomplete. So you'd feel why like is it that we're going to award partial? Like a man, you'd, f- you'd feel like a failure. Let's just thank you. Say it the way we're both married, man. Let's just put it all yes. on the table. We would feel like failures. Three thank out you. of three so, out of nine. Hell mm-hmm. no! Unacceptable, so why, man. <laughs> so why would we award partial success to someone? <laughs> Now, I will mention more along the lines, too, but why wouldn't the reward give a participation trophy to oh, a God. guy who, yes, he's undefeated in the first round. I'm happy that LeBron James is undefeated in the first round. But Wonderful. Would you rather be, but, and I think I know where you're going, so I'll complete your question. Would you rather be undefeated please. in the first round or undefeated in the World Championship Series? I would be, I would rather be undefeated in the World Championship Series because that would mean that, my my name, whether I was the number one guy on the team or not, but in Jordan's case, he was. If I'm the number one man on the team and I get a chance to go to the biggest series of my sports year six times, yep. and all six times I'm the best player on the court and win for my team, I'd rather that than to claim that I'm that I'm whatever and oh, I don't know how many first round series LeBron James has played in. I really don't care. But whatever and oh, in every series I played the first round. You better. T- be- you know what? Take the. You know what? I will close with this. Take this with you to your bronze sexual confession tomorrow. Let me add. I'm going to add this for you, and I'm going to give you a big old lob. All right. Mm-hmm. The teams that Michael Jordan had to face in the first round, eighty-five. Mm-hmm. 
a two-time defensive player of the year in Sidney Moncrief and the Milwaukee Bucks. 86, the Boston Celtics. Enough said. 87, mm-hmm. the Boston Celtics. Enough said. Okay, they and, were not oh, slouches either. And, yeah. and, and oh, by mm-hmm. the way, in '87, the the Boston Celtics were the defending world champions, and they got to the World Championship Series in '86, yep. in '86 and '87. Milwaukee yep. loses. In in, they, yep. Yep. '85, mm-hmm. they, Milwaukee loses to Philadelphia in mm-hmm. the Eastern semifinals. And by Definitely. the way, Julius the Doctor Irving was still playing. Charles Barkley was a second year player. Young. Maurice Cheeks, mm-hmm. Andrew Tony, yeah. yeah, Michael Jordan had what a to. Team. Michael Jordan had to face some legends, and and by yes. the yeah, and and by the way, Billy Cunningham had just retired as coach of the Philadelphia Seventy mm. Sixers. Okay, and underrated. Billy, yep, and, and underrated Billy, coach. And Billy Cunningham brought him brought his team to the World Championship Series, got himself a title. So to that bronze sexual, and I'm giving you this. I'm, we're running a fast break, and I see you peeling out, ready to go up. Michael Jordan had to go through something LeBron hasn't gone through in 17 years. It's called a progression to being a champion. Actually, I will take. I will. I will, I will go one step further. Not only did Michael Jordan had to go through a progression, and we saw that progression, like you mentioned. With the underrated 1985 Bucks team, because people yep. rarely ever mention that team. Yep. The 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 greatest to me the greatest basketball team I've ever seen play the '86 Celtics, 86 and then Celtics. the '87 Celtics, which they were no slouches because not only did they get to the World Championship Series on the way to there, they beat the Bad Boys Pistons to get yep. there. Yep. So, uh, I mean, <laughs> those those were three tough teams. That Jordan had to play in his first three playoffs since. Yep. So I, I'm, I'm not. And then, and then the next three years, Pistons, Pistons, Pistons. Yep. So you can't tell me. And, and 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 for those who don't know the basketball history, the Pistons all three years at least went to the World Championship Series slash NBA Finals, and in, and in eighty nine and ninety won the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So. In, in Jordan's first six years in the league, he got one of the greatest basketball educations that any any elite superstar could ever get. I'll take that kind of education. If it means taking some L's against some great teams, I'll take those L's. I mean, Milwaukee yeah. had to take a couple against Philadelphia in the 80s before, mm-hmm. they, ro- before yeah. they rose to a brief power in 85, 86, and 87. And remember, the Milwaukee Bucks had to face the Boston Celtics three times. Okay. <laughs> oh gosh. That's why I felt that's why I felt for the bus. I was like, Ben, you came up during the wrong time, wrong mm-hmm. era. They did. They did. The only time the Bucks got past Boston was nineteen eighty three when they swept right. the Boston and, Celtics and then they lost they in and to they, go to the Sixers. they swept it they swept the Boston <laughs> Celtics. They swept the Boston Celtics in eighty three and then you run into Moses Malone and Dr. J and the Philadelphia seventy <laughs> sixers. That's what I'm saying. The, the time they get past the Celtics, then they, they run against the best Sixers team in the history of the organization. Yes. I'm like, that's cold. That's, I was like, man, they kept up during the wrong time. That's just wrong, okay? Sidney Moncrief against Sidney Moncrief trying to defend Andrew Tony. <laughs> Mr. Uh, 15 foot jumper himself, man. The, oh. Bo- the Boston Strangler, as he was coined. Because, mm. of the, because of his Game 7 performance, 31 points in right. 1982. In 92. the Boston Garden. Okay? Yep. So the progression that Michael Jordan had to go through was there. The legends were already established. And oh by the and oh by the way, Michael Jordan does own a game winning jump shot in nineteen eighty five. That occurred in game four uh, game three in Chicago Stadium, I beg your pardon. Game three. So he had to go through so, that and had to go through mm-hmm. a five game series with an up and coming Cleveland Cavaliers ball club, not once but twice, eighty eight and eighty nine, and we know what happened May seventh, nineteen eighty nine. So yes. anything that LeBron is being praised for, Michael Jordan fought off to get to the ultimate round, which is the world championship series. Here is where I push back against a Bron sexual on that. <laughs> So LeBron looked like he was on that trajectory to actually progress the way, not not exactly the way Jordan did, but similarly to how Jordan did. Because, I mean, he ran into, 
we ran into this bad boy Pistons with the Celtics, the, mm-hmm. the, the big three, the Celtics. He did. So if he were to have done his homework and been that, that guy that I think we as old school basketball uh, fans would respect, he would take that team, learn the lesson he learned in, eight, in, in 2008. Um, in my opinion, I think he, he should have, he, he should have found a way to to get to that NBA Finals in 2009. Mm-hmm. Yep, he should have. I'm, I'm not I'm not discounting the the Magic. No, I'm not discounting them not at, all. at all. Not but, at all. But if but he I, he should have found a way to have that team go to the finals that year. When he got a chance to play against the Celtics in 2010, he had home court advantage to boot. That should have been a series <laughs> where people would say. LeBron has arrived. What does he do? He lays he an egg. He checks out game five of that series, gets bounced in six, and he decides to make a, th- make a big three of his own, and he doesn't, quote, scale the mountain, close quote, when it comes to the Celtics until 2012. Well, as you've heard the mouth of Kevin Garnett, he doesn't respect that, and I totally understand why, because old school dictates that – if you meet up against a mountain with the team that you that, that you originally bring to that mountain, you've got to scale that mountain and beat them to get to that top with that squad. Yep. Not go to another squad to do it. And and I think the bronze sexuals they forget. Uh, Jordan didn't do a bypassing of a progression. His thought was. I don't give a crap if I have a leather broomsticks on the yep. on, on on the court with me. Yep, I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna bring him a championship. He thought that back in '84 when he didn't have all the skills necessary, and I'm not talking about all the physical skills. I'm talking about all the mental skills that it took to be that champion. But that's how he thought. That's how he thought in '84. Yep. He thought that. So so of course it stood. To reason yeah. that seven years later he would do it when he actually had a semblance of a team with him. Yeah, yeah. And, and with and LeBron, it was not the case because he nope. needed to have a situation that was suited for him instead of being the guy where people built around him. Mm-hmm. And that is what happened with Jordan. He was the guy the the organization realized that then they started to build pieces around him to complement him. The same was not said for LeBron, nope. especially with the fact that he wanted to handpick teams and he wanted to be the general <laughs> manager of the Cavs and say, I want this guy on our team. I want this guy on the highest. In the front office say, you have this skill set. Why don't we take some of the some of the pressure off you by having this guy do this thing, this guy do this thing, this guy do this thing, and we're going to build a team around you. You're going to be the centerpiece, and we're going to bring you that championship. No, he didn't. He just he, he figured he was the guy. He was he was the big man on campus, and voila, a championship would appear. Well, that didn't happen. He was like, okay, well, let me go to a place where I can play with a buddy, uh, bring another <laughs> all star along with me, and then we can get a championship. And he followed that up the first year. He did. So, I mean, he did. <laughs> I mean, it was bad. It was bad. I mean, it, uh, and I, I can go on about that. You, you know what? <laughs> it was it was bad. Mm-hmm. It was bad. I mean, LeBron basically fouled up his shot at a championship in two thousand nine. He did. He fouled he up. He did. His- and, and 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 before people get on both of us, yes, I realize. He scored close to 40 points in that series. Yes. And I think he pulled down like eight rebounds, eight assists in there too. Absolutely. Yeah, I realized that. Absolutely. I realized that. Mm-hmm. I realized that. Thing is, when you have that issue, you're supposed to also help the other teammates bring you along instead yep. of basically be the guy, mm-hmm. the only guy. Yeah. Because Jordan, even though he could score with the best of them, Yes. He always found a way to get his teammates involved. <laughs> always did. did. And, 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 and contrary to popular opinion, Jordan didn't always, one, want to take the last shot. Right. If he needed to, he would. Mm-hmm. 
and he didn't too need to take the last shot. Correct. All he wanted to do was at least have the ball in his hands so he can make the right basketball play. Yep. And if it meant he took the shot, cool. If it meant there was a teammate that was wide open, cool. Steve uh, Kerr. Circa 1997 NBA Steve Finals. Steve Kerr. Kerr. Do you hear me? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> The IQ of LeBron was not as strong as it should have been, and that is my issue with him. Johnny Paxson, 1993, although he got an assist from Pippen and Grant, so there were three assists on that play. Jordan whipped it to Pippen. Right. Pippen flipped it to Grant. Mm-hmm. Grant flipped it back out to Paxson. You know the rest of the story. And also, right. I don't think LeBron has had this kind of iconic moment. The day was April 20th, 1986. My beloved favorite announcer, the late great Jimmer, had this. Michael on the drive across the lane. Turnaround shot. Got it. 63 for Jordan. Yeah. I I can't find that kind of signature moment. And don't give me that chase down block against the Golden State Warriors. It shouldn't have gone to a seventh game anyway in that series. And you know how I feel about that series. So don't give me that chase down block. That's not the one they should bring up. If if any if any LeBron James fan worth his salt would actually bring if they were to challenge you and bring up the right type of iconic not necessarily play but iconic moment game five Eastern Conference Finals the fourth quarter in overtime to me that was his iconic moment mm-hmm. and 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 and, Le, and to me LeBron in the thirteen years since has not eclipsed that. He hasn't even come close to it. Nope. And no, don't give me that and don't give me that Cleveland. This is for you. Don't Moment hand nine me years that. later. No. Don't hand me that. No. Don't no. hand me that. No. That, that, no. that mo- the, no. Cle- what, Cleveland, no. this is for you, really? No. David Stern put that in motion. LeBron put that <laughs> and you know what, I'll go one step further. You want a lob? Here it is. LeBron put that in motion after he got his butt kicked in Game Four of the World Championship Series because D- Draymond Green bodied him up. Period. Don't and that's all that happened. <laughs> he bodied him up, and he, oh, I can't deal with Draymond Green. Oh yeah, try that. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> I, I always laugh at Stephen e. Smith. He always says that the uh, that LeBron James received a stimulus package for that. <laughs> Did they not receive a big fat stimulus package? <laughs> did they oh, did did they not receive a stimulus package among stimulus packages? Well, well, well I mean that series would have been over to five. So it should yeah, I guess have you, been. I guess you say it did. It should have been a. And I will always contend this. People will think, "Oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist." No, I know what I saw and I know what I heard. That was a five game conquest waiting to happen. Period. And I've and I've said this to you on air and off air. Uh, that suspension, that one game suspension that, that that Green served, it should not have been in that series. It should have been the series before in the Western but Finals, they, West Conference Finals. But they gave him a pass in that series. They decided to issue that one game suspension in this series. Mm-hmm. And to me, along those lines, that to me is a conspiracy theory that I think holds water and is true. I'm like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we Green didn't do anything to me that warranted the suspension after Game Four. Right. He, he didn't. He he really he didn't. didn't. He he really didn't. That should have been a five game conquest. And I've gone way mm-hmm. over time here. I gotta I gotta move on. But <laughs> listen, I'm bringing back Snowman Unfiltered, and you know I'm getting you on the phone, and we're just gonna cut up about this and 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 many many other things i'll let you know when the relaunch is this is cole johnson the man in charge of cole johnson on the daily and cole sports look for the vip honors yours truly will be a part of that we're going to have some great voices on there man thank you so much for hopping on i truly appreciate it uh thank you so much and thank you for being a part of vip honors which will be this sunday i'm so thankful all right all right what oh shucks that means i got some work to do you'll have what you'll you'll have what you need i got so hung up yeah we'll 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 talk thanks a lot man appreciate the time No, no problem man this is snowman in the morning where true sports talk lives. I like him. He's silly. 
A lot of stuff going on here on Snowman in the Morning. A welcome to our new affiliates that have uh, picked up the show. And as mentioned, if you want to sponsor this here program, all you have to do is drop an email to our new address, Snowman Digital Media at gmail.com. That's Snowman Digital Media at gmail.com. Don't forget, you can follow us on all of our social media by using the ID SITM9 to noon. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Pinterest. Yes, we do have a Pinterest page for the show. That's where you can follow everything and get all of the updates as we're getting everything together. We're getting everything streamlined. SITM9 to noon. About to come to the finish line for the Tuesday episode of Snowman in the Morning. Coming up on Wednesday, Mike DeBate will join me to break down both conference championships with the Chiefs and the 49ers winning. Also, Oni Guillen, one of the bouncing baby boys of World Series winning manager Ozzy Guillen, set to join me on Wednesday Later on this week, on Friday, Mike DeBate returns. Damian Adams, the host of The Real Deal with Damian Adams, will join me. I'm going to get William Morgan on the line for Thursday to talk an old-school NBA conversation that's going to be split into four different parts. You don't want to miss that one. That's coming your way on Thursday. Well, to kind of put a wrap on this here as I look around my home studio, there's a project that my wife, Dr. Kay, and I have started doing. And it's been a real eye-opener for me and a real good change. And if you listen to the segment I did earlier today with uh, Russ Williams for Transition Tuesday, he talked about having a positive mindset And I have to be totally honest with you guys. I've really had to change my mindset. And it took, and I've said that on this show, it took me meeting my beloved Dr. K to get to change that, to start the change to that mindset. Do I have my days? Of course I do. But the bad days, for the most part, have been physically bad because of where I work in the morning before I come home you know, get everything together and then hop on the show. Be that as it may, Russ Williams had a great segment with me, and I wanted to just share that with you guys and share my journey with you guys, our journey. I got to learn how to say our instead of just my because it's not just me anymore. It's my family. It's my wife. It's my daughter. It's my son, um, all my stepdaughters. It's all of them. It's not just about me anymore and i have to remember that i have to remember that so folks i want to leave you with uh some positive words and the positive words are these remember who you surround yourself with and going back to the uh, transition tuesday surround yourself with positive people surround yourself with championship people Surround yourself with the right people. Now to wrap it up for this Tuesday edition, thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to catch us on all of our great affiliates, including Full Press Coverage, Arena Sports Net, KSRN Arizona, and others. And thank you to everyone that has helped keep this show on. Remember, if you want to help us out, drop an email to Snowman Digital Media at gmail.com that's snowman digital media at gmail.com my time's up i'll talk to you on wednesday have a great day god bless remember to make your next move your best move and always remember if your dreams don't scare you then they are not big enough dream big do bigger i am and i hope y'all are too and congratulations once again to the kansas city chiefs and the san francisco 49ers Thank you also to my guests, Desmond Johnson, Chris Pirtle, C.J. Swartz, as well as the guests I'm going to have tomorrow. Mike DeBate will be with me tomorrow, as well as Oni Gian and all my other rowdy friends to help the Wednesday edition of Snowman in the Morning. My time's up. I'm out of here. I'll talk to you all tomorrow. Until then, 
Snowman's out of here. Bye-bye. Rock.